our monthly live stream discussion of a book chosen by you, our listeners. My name is Matt Freeman, and uh, this dir dirty propertarian over here is uh, my co-host, Scott Daly. Psh, wh whatever, man. Money's cool. I can buy stuff with it. I like, I like stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome. Matt, I mistimed your intro, so they missed the very beginning of it, but that's fine. Um, don't worry about that at all. Worst things have happened. <laughs> uh, welcome, everyone. Happy Friday. I hope you all had a wonderful holiday last week, if you are in the United States, um, and you're having a good Friday evening. Uh, I'm sure we know a lot of you folks in the chat. I see a lot of familiar names, but if you are joining us for the very first time, welcome. Feel free to say hello in chat. We are Doof Media, and we make podcasts all about the stories that we love. We also arrange and organize this monthly book club in which Matt will explain now. Uh, so yeah, each month, Scott and I select five books from a pool submitted to us by our wonderful Doof community. We put up a poll for all of the supporters on Patreon at patreon.com slash doofmedia, and we let them vote on which they'd like us to talk about. The book with the most votes wins, and then we all read it. Yeah, and then we meet here on the last Friday of the month, unless that happens to be a holiday in which we push it a week like we did this week, and we spend a couple of hours discussing this book. We pull slides of interesting or important moments, and we, Matt and I kind of try to lead a discussion all about this story. Matt, what is the name of the book we're talking about today? The book we're discussing today is The Dispossessed by Ursula K. Le Guin, and the summary of the book is as follows. Shevik, a brilliant physicist, decides to take action. He will seek answers, question the unquestionable, and attempt to tear down the walls of hatred that have isolated his planet of anarchists from the rest of the civilized universe. To do this dangerous task will mean giving up his family and possibly his life. Shevik must make the unprecedented journey to the utopian mother planet, Eris, to challenge the complex structures of life and living and ignite the fires of change. All right, Goodreads. That's, you know, that, a summary. Yeah. <laughs> sort of sort of flattening one of the most rich and complicated books I've read in my life into like a YA novel, basically. <laughs> but, but what are you going to do? Yeah. Uh, so, Matt, um, so this is the part of the show where we talk about our overall impressions of the book before we get into the specifics. And I'm only setting this up so you folks out there will have time to weigh in. Uh, I want to hear what I think this this chat is going on already, but I want to hear what you thought of this book, if this was your first time reading it or if you've read this book many times. Uh, what new did you take from it on this read? And while you guys are doing that, Matt will tell me what he thought of this book. Matt, what did you think of this book? I love this book. Uh, I think this is my favorite of Le Guin's books so far. Uh, this book challenged me. It it, uh, it it swerved in in what I thought it was saying multiple times and continually made me feel stupid and and as if I were trying to fit a simplistic lens onto a onto a thing that was more complicated than I was giving it credit for. Um, I I. I it, it it upset me in various ways, which which you know in a good, in a good way I should say, mm -hmm. um and and just overall, uh, I I've been thinking about it ever since I finished reading it. Um, I could go on and on honestly, but and, I will pause. And, and we will. Reaction. Yes, we will. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, you know, we've been doing this for a while now, and I think like you read a lot of good books by a lot of very good authors. Um, a lot of people I would I would happily label genius. Um, this is one of the best books I've ever read. This book was staggering to me in its brilliance. It is the type of thing where just having this conversation is one of the most overwhelming things to me right now, because I just think there's no way that I could even begin to do this book justice. Um, I, I, th I think it's, it's brilliantly constructed. It's brilliantly executed. It's, it's firing on all cylinders. It's doing so many different things. I I'm absolutely with you that, that this book challenged me. Um, and it, it challenged my preconceived notions of things that I believe a challenge, preconceived notions of what I thought this book was going to be. I think one of the most brilliant things about it is no matter what, uh, preconception you have going into the book it will be challenged that's just like by design i feel like it's just what the book is doing um i i was blown away i was absolutely blown away this is one of those books that i just felt you know like we read a bunch of books and and 
in general, in general, I enjoy the books we read for book club because because people are voting on them. They're generally good books. You know, normally people don't vote for a bad book, right? Mm -hmm. Um, So we normally get a a very good pile of very good books. Um, I've I this is like at the top of that pile to me, Um, and and I'm not. The thing is, I'm not entirely a hundred percent sure that I have a really good grasp on what the book is trying to do. Um, and I think that's okay because I think that's, that's, I think that's what the book, that's how the book wants you to feel a little bit. Um, yeah. I feel like, um, I, I swerved in my assessment of what the book was trying to do several times. And then I just sort of stepped back from it. And I, and I think in the end I, I thought, okay, I think what she's trying to do is just make everyone who approaches the book less certain and less simplistic and less totalizing in their yeah. feeling about what the right answer is. Um, and, and even that, I don't feel like I've nailed down everything she's trying to do. Um, uh, there's a few scenes in the book where I, I think like, I ha- I feel like I have a direction that I'm going with, but I don't quite know, um, what the, what the intended takeaway is. And I think that's fine. I think a lot of what she's doing is giving you these situations, these, these little nuggets of food for thought that you take away and you're just like, well, what do I, what do I believe about this actually? Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's a, there's a slide that I had pulled, but I think I ended up cutting it because I surprise guys, I pulled way too many pieces of this book. Um, but there was one when they were talking about, you know, how you look at things. And, and when you look at things from a distance, like they're looking up at the moon and, and Shevik's wife is talking about why does this look so beautiful when I know it's this, this dystopian nightmare down there or up there rather. Um, and he's like, everything looks beautiful from a distance and it's the closer you get to it. And I think that's a good kind of overall lesson for everything this book is doing. The, the utopian society, the capitalistic society, the, uh, obviously Soviet Russian (laughs) analog society, like, and the concept of, okay, we know, like, I think, I think Le Guin is pretty clear that like, she thinks that not that the, this form of organization or government is not working and is causing suffering. Right. And she's like, all right, let's dive into what what the solution to that would look like. And when we dive into that thing, we can't just look at it at this 100-foot level. We can't look at it at this, oh, it's this beautiful utopia. We have to dive into it. We have to really explore what it means to live in that society. And there are a lot of wonderful things about this that society. And there are, to me, a lot of absolutely terrifying things about yeah. that society. Right. I mean, I think that's one of the things that she may be doing is, is basically saying – Um, there is no utopia and people's attempts to make utopia generally are going to create horrible situations. Yeah. Um, Create ambiguity maybe. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Cause uh, people in chat are talking about the sub, this, uh, the subtitle of, uh, an ambiguous utopia with, uh, which is just, it's perfect. It's absolutely perfect. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. All right. So let's, uh, we've been kind of gesturing towards chap we haven't been actually reading it so let's see what people think so it looks like miss evil doom uh this was the first time they read it and uh they thought they'd probably get a little more out of it on a second reread i i kind of can't wait to reread this book because i feel like i i will be the same way that i will pull entirely new different exciting things out of it yeah um it's interesting um john is talking about how you know different things have hit them at, at different points in time I think, sorry, there, there's a lot of chat uh, this time, which, which makes sense because it was a really good book and people are, are enjoying talking about it. But mm-hmm. um, I'm getting a sentiment as I'm sort of scanning through that, like, pe- some of these people have reread it many times. It's their favorite book in some cases. And um, and, and they get they get different things out of it as they reread it more, which is interesting because I... I've only read it the one time for the book club, so I, I feel like I should read it again at some point. Yeah, I, I, it, it does it does very much feel like the type of book that reading it at various points throughout your, your life's journey would uh, change the way you interact with it. It feels like that kind of book. Yeah. yeah. Um, let's see. We have... Grass Grassack <laughs> um, said that they read it a handful of times and they actually co-hosted a book club about it. Oh, that's cool. Awesome. You'll probably do a better job than than me. Um, <laughs> uh, Miss says that agrees that you need to read it multiple times. Um, let's see where else we got. Uh, it's it's Jake's favorite book of all time. That's that's great. Yeah, this is great. Um, 
and and they say that it'll gain some depth if you've read the ones who walk away from Amalas, which is that short story that I mentioned previously. Um, mm. That's that makes sense. I I, I get that. Um, I didn't think about it that way. But uh, there's an Odo short story. Interesting. Oh, I want to read like that. A, yeah. Like a separate short story about Odo. That's cool. I wonder if Odo in Deep Space Nine is a reference to this. Probably. Probably, right? It seems to. Be. But, I mean, what does Odo in Deep Space Nine have to do with, with the Odo in this book? Maybe it was just like a fun, just a, a, you're sitting in a writer's room. We need a name for this character. Yeah. One of your writers really loves the dispossessed. Yeah. Um, lots of lots of chat, Scott. I think oh, we yeah. might just have to do the book club. Yeah, let's and... just move into it, and and we can we can continue to talk with y'all as we get through yeah, this yeah. stuff. Uh, so let's start at the beginning. All right. Uh, so we begin with the opening lines as we usually do. Mm-hmm. There was a wall. It did not look important. It was built of uncut rocks, roughly mortared. An adult could look right over it, and even a child could climb it. Where it crossed the roadway, instead of having a gate, it degenerated into mere geometry, a line, an idea of boundary. But the idea was real. It was important. For seven generations, there had been nothing in the world more important than that wall. Like all walls, it was ambiguous, two-faced. What was inside it and what was outside, it depended on which side of it you were on. Looked at from one side, the wall enclosed a barren 60-acre field called the Port of Anaris, On the field were a couple of large gantry cranes, a rocket pad, three warehouses, a truck garage, and a dormitory. The dormitory looked durable, grimy, and mournful. It had no gardens, no children. Plainly, nobody lived there, or was even meant to stay there long. It was, in fact, a quarantine. The wall shut in not only the landing field, but also the ships that came down out of space, and the men that came on the ships, and the worlds they came from, and the rest of the universe. It enclosed the universe, leaving Anaris outside, free. Looked at from the other side, the wall enclosed Anaris. The whole planet was inside it, a great prison camp, cut off from other worlds and other men in quarantine. Well, that's the whole book right there. <laughs> yeah. You can just stop. I mean, it, it literally is, though. That's the, that's the brilliance of this book is that is kind of – it is the perfect way – to establish exactly what Le Guin is trying to do with this book, I think that this this just I, I central idea. I mean, like walls are this recurring motif throughout the story, right? Like uh, Shevik constantly talks about the walls, the walls that we build around ourselves, the walls that are built around us, how how we perceive these walls, and this this idea of freedom and what freedom is are, are is a completely different term with different meanings depending on which side of that wall you're on. Mm-hmm. And it's just it's just remarkable that she spells it out here for you in the very beginning. And I think I think it's part of what I think is the the challenging your notions part of this, because everyone comes into this this story with with their own ideas on on what is right and what is wrong, what is a correct way to do things, what is a wrong way to do things. And and she's telling you right here, well, your perspective on that is based on which side of this wall you're on. Um, and. I'm going to challenge you on that. Like you know, as she's saying, she's spelling it out right here. I'm going to mm-hmm. challenge you on that. Here it is. Because this wall has complete different meaning to each side. Um, yeah. and, and I think different people approaching this book might actually be approaching it from different sides of that wall. Yeah. And and I really do think that everyone, I mean, I definitely approached it from one you know particular side due to my own nature. And sure. by the end of it, I just, I, I was just a lot less, you know, confident in, um, in my rightness, and I, I can imagine that someone approaching it from the other side would feel the same way. Yeah, yeah. But um, I mean, this this first page is is downright intimidating, though, because as <laughs> I was reading through it, I was like, every sentence, I was like, oh, I want to I want to be sure to talk about that sentence. <laughs> and then and then by the time I got to the end, I was just like, all right, well, there's no hope of talking about this book in the level of detail it deserves because yeah. every sentence of this first bit is perfect, right? Yeah, I mean, that, that was my difficulty in pulling the slides for this is that like, you know, I've, I've talked about this before. My general strategy for book club is while I'm reading the book, anytime something strikes my fancy, something feels important, feels relevant, or it's just a, a turn of phrase that I particularly like, I have my phone next to me while I'm reading and I jot down the page number and like a note to remind myself of what it is. And this is a 300 and something page book, right? It's not that long. Um, mm-hmm. I, I had a f- 80 90 of those throughout the book 
Um, and, and normally one of those will correspond to a slide, and I usually have to cut it in half to get down to our 15 slides. Uh, so this is three times as much. Um, so, yeah, I mean, like, I, I look at the, the just the book opens making sure you understand that this is a thing that does not look important on the surface, but is the most important thing in the world, right? Mm-hmm. And, yeah. and and I think that is that is such yeah. a clever way of defining, like, it's going to seem like these differences aren't as important. It's going to seem like this, this divide is not important, but it is the most important thing in the world. Yeah. Um, I, I love the idea that, that, where it crosses the road, it degenerates into geometry, an uh-huh. idea of a boundary. Uh-huh. And that's just so great because so much of this story is about the walls inside people, right? Mm-hmm. There's, mm-hmm. you know, the, the, the characters, they talk about this idea that there's, there's a wall, the, the, the wall that divides the world runs through every person. And, and, um, you know, that there's, there's the idea that there, there's, there's these rules that they have in their society, for example, that, um, that are completely uh, uh, sort of imposed by the by the individual on themselves, yeah. and yet they're just as as kind of limiting as anything. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, but that's that's something I hope we'll talk to you more later. That's just kind of one implementation of that particular idea. We we certainly will. Yeah. Um. And, and as Jake is pointing out, the structure of this book, you know, we we have we have this back and forth chapter structure where. Uh, first chapter, we go to the present with uh, Shevik's dealings on on Eurus, and then in the alternating chapter, we go back in time and to his life on Anaris, Anaris. Um and that is that is a structural wall between those two parts, right? The book is building this kind of structural wall divided by the chapter break, mm-hmm. and and you, I think Jake's absolutely right here that 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 ties into the theme. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And as John says, it's also a circular narrative with a line running through it, which ties perfectly <laughs> into um, this whole this whole constant debate of sequentialism versus simultaneism. Um, mm. And we will get into that as well. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. All right. Want to move on? Yeah. So let's uh, let's jump to our ship as our main character, Shevik, heads down to Eurus. And uh, we learn a little bit about how... How different these peoples are going to be. The second officer, he said, seems to be afraid of me. Oh, with him, it's religious bigotry. He's a strict interpretation epiphanist, recites the primes every night, a totally rigid mind. So he sees me, how? As a dangerous atheist. An atheist? Why? Why, because you're an Odonian from Anaris. There's no religion on Anaris. No religion? Are we stones on Anaris? I mean established religion, churches, creeds. Kimo flustered easily. He had the physician's brisk self-assurance, but Shevik continually upset it. All his explanations ended up, after two or three of Shevik's questions, in floundering. Each took for granted certain relationships that the other could not even see. For instance, this curious matter of superiority of relative height was important to the Erasti. They often used the word higher as a synonym for better in their writings, where an Anaresti would use more central. But what did being higher have to do with being foreign? It was one puzzle amongst hundreds. I see, he said now, another puzzle coming clear. You admit no religion outside the churches, just as you admit no morality outside the laws. You know, I had not ever understood that in all my reading of your asty books. Well, these days any enlightened person would admit. The vocabulary makes it difficult, Shevik said, pursuing his discovery. In Pravik, the word religion is seldom. No, what do you say? Rare, not often used. Of course, it is one of the categories, the fourth mode. Few people learn to practice all the modes, but the modes are built of the natural capacities of the mind. You could not seriously believe that we had no religious capacity, that we could do physics while we were cut off from the profoundest relationship man has with the cosmos? Oh no, no, not at all. That would make that would make to be a pseudo-species of us indeed. Educated men certainly would understand that. These officers are ignorant. But it is only bigots, then, who are allowed to go out into the cosmos." <laughs> Um, so there's a few things I wanted to, to, to jump in on here in this passage. The biggest one, though, is Shevik's uh, recurring beat of interrupting people, which uh-huh. he does c- consistently throughout the story. Um, he likes to uh, monologue continuously in his uh-huh. argument, and he doesn't listen when people are interrupting, and he just keep, keeps, keeps going. 
Yes, I mean it, it becomes an endearing character trait sure. because he's he's this he's this stranger in a strange land. It's especially in the in the uh, you know the future um, part of the book, mm-hmm. and he's he's so blind to so many things. Like like sort of the process of that storyline is him becoming less and less blind to the sure. things that are you know that are potentially going to get him killed. Actually, because mm-hmm. he's so sort of almost pr- profoundly ignorant of, of how that world works. Um, and, and so, you know, he, he's also just, just kind of, uh, kind of an absent, absent minded professor type Yeah, where yeah. He's, he's, he's clearly brilliant. And like the excitement of, you know, this, this cultural thing that he thinks he just figured out overwhelms his, his desire to be polite. And, um, yeah, yeah, he, he's a, he's a, he's a fun, interesting character. Um, yeah. I like him a lot, but it's it's so funny to me, especially on my when I was pulling the slides, like how many times you see the the M dash of someone trying to speak and him just jumping in with just going just going further with his own his own thought. It's it's really wonderful. Yeah. Um, yeah. I wish I wish the audiobook reader had done more of a characteristic voice for Shevik, just so that that would be more apparent. I mean, I think I usually figured it out, but yeah, the person interrupting themselves is usually hard to you know. Yeah, I mean, even when I was reading it there, it's tough. Like, you kind of, I wonder in, like, the audiobook if they edit it to make the sounds layer on top of each other a little bit more to make that interruption clear. They don't, but, uh... Yeah. If if anything, there's usually too much of a pause, and you're like, that's not how that would go, but it's fine. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Um... But I mean, this also just kind of starts our our general understanding of of the the butting heads uh, that these two civilizations are going to have with each other, right? This is really the first time that people have interacted, um, mm-hmm. and I, I love the paragraph about just like the 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 base differences that become like things you would never even think about, like just the the language we use, the the that we don't even like the idea of hire as just mm-hmm. a result of how we how we measure class differences and 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 measure superiority like that's something and i think that's something that this book does really well because like uh, we have two different worlds in this book one of them is a world that is very familiar to us the reader it's not exactly like like uh, if you're if you're an american it's not exactly like the united states but it's meant to be close it's meant to feel familiar and we have a person that has not grown up in this world observing it and so through his perspective we can see things about our way of life that we've never thought about before and then we have a person in a world that is completely unfamiliar to us growing up in his own world and he's kind of totally indoctrinated in it because he's just been in it his whole life but it is foreign to us so we see it from that outside perspective and Mm -hmm. it's really really wonderful i just love that that how that works and how it how it when like it it feels designed right she did it that way on purpose yeah well it allows you to see like 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 you see there's nothing especially remarkable about this you know this doctor chemo that he's Mm -hmm. talking to right except because of the contrast to shevik we see him as like this egotistical sort of fragile, um, you know, easily offended character. But that's just because Shevik like constantly unintentionally offends him by not caring about the rules that we would all sort of automatically keep in mind. Like, um, you know, I mean, even, I mean, in our society, height counts for something, right? So the, the fact that Shevik sort of, benefits from the social standing of being super tall but doesn't seem to <laughs> like the, the the fact that he doesn't appreciate it if anything makes it more offensive if you know what i mean like that, uh, that that's how that's how uh that's how that kind of person would see the situation you yeah know? yeah yeah um it, it uh, is great that i yeah that they're all taller right lower gravity i guess is the mm-hmm. the idea that they just grew grew lengthier yeah um yeah it's perfect. Love it. Love it. Um, all right. Anything else on this slide? Well, they talk about religion a bit, but I don't know. Um, it doesn't seem to be a huge part of the story, and I don't. That's one theme where I just don't know what I have to say about it. Yeah, I mean, it's. It, I I love the idea of this this general idea that you know a lot of people look at religion as the the institution, right? The the dogma, and mm-hmm. a lot of people look at this as more, just much more spiritual, much more loose, much more yeah. just these these 
this this feeling this feeling of greatness and and a power beyond our own that exists in the in the nebulous universe somewhere yeah. um and, and i mean shevik seems to do his physics in a in a mental space that that seems to us more like a spiritual space yeah than yeah. uh than, than than kind of the coldness of how we think of mathematics as being yeah, so. and and I mean, it makes sense that a, in a society like an uh, an anarchist society like this, they would not have any kind of formalized religion. Mm-hmm. You know, um, the most yeah. they have is is Odo, which you could call as a, almost a, almost a form of religion. But it's they they're very clear that it's just it's philosophy. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it does have a lot of the qualities of ancestor worship and sure, um, sure. And she, you know, Odo is clearly in a kind of a kind of idol to them. Yeah, but, yeah, but. But they're not supposed to think that way, but mm-hmm. but she is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, All right, let's uh, move on to the next yeah. one. Okay, so next slide. Uh, we basically we meet Shevik as a child and see that even as a child, Shevik was a bit different from everyone else. Mm-hmm. Well, I had an idea. Louder said the director, a heavy set man in his early twenties. The boy smiled with embarrassment. Well, see, I was thinking, let's say you throw a rock at something, at a tree. You throw it and it goes through the air and hits the tree, right? But it can't because can, can I have the slate? Look, here's you throwing the rock and here's the tree. He scribbled on the slate. That's supposed to be a tree and here's the rock. See, halfway in between. The children giggled at his portrayal of a holum tree and he smiled. To get from you to the tree, the rock has to be halfway in between you and the tree, doesn't it? And then it has to be halfway between halfway in the tree. And then it has to be halfway between that and the tree. Doesn't matter how far it goes. There's always a place, only it's a time, really, that's halfway between the last place it was and the tree. Do you think this is interesting? The director interrupted, speaking to the other children. Why can't it reach the tree? Said a, a girl. So, I, uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know. This is copy-pasted, so it's not my okay. fault. <laughs> because it always has to go half of the way that's left to go, said Shevik. And there's always half of the way left to go, see? Shall we just say the... The rock, the, yeah, sorry, shall we just say you aim the rock badly? The director said with a tight smile. It doesn't matter how you aim it. It can't reach the tree. Who told you this idea? Nobody. I sort of saw it. I think I see how the rock actually does. That's enough. Some of the other children had been talking, but they stopped as if struck dumb. The little boy with the slate stood there in the silence. He looked frightened and scowled. Speech is sharing, a cooperative act. You're not sharing, merely egoizing. Um... So, so we we begin one, the first part of the book that gave me anxiety and made me very upset. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it, this is this is one of our earliest introductions to to the Anaris society, right? Is this yeah. seeing this kid who has just come up with this really cool idea, and as we see later, is also kind of telling trying to tell a joke, but it's a joke based on this this idea that appears to be above and beyond what anyone else is thinking about right now, and he is he is silenced out of it. Yeah, well, he, he's come up with Zeno's paradox on his own, right? And he, and so, it, but he's accused of having mm-hmm. ripped it off from somewhere, and he's accused of being egotistical by even by even wanting to share an idea that he had in his own mind. Mm-hmm. Um, which, you know, I, and I think that's one of the the cool things about using Shevik as the protagonist is that Shevik is a a unique mind. Yeah, and the thing is, and this is my editorializing, but I think I think everyone is a unique mind in some way or another. Shevik just happens to be a very unique mind because he's this brilliant genius. Um, and, and like if, if the protagonist of the book had been, you know, if, if the window through which we're seeing this society had been sort of a person with, with no really outstanding characteristics, then I think maybe their experience of the society could have been very, very different because right, they just, right. they just fit in. They just fit into the box that the society, the society has shaped them and it's people like them that shape the society because that's how, averages work but shevik like i think many people in this society many of the other characters who we meet throughout the story is a poor fit um Mm -hmm. and and it's very painful for him as he you know rubs up against the the strictures that the society puts on him which is fascinating because like it's an anarchist society what do you mean (laughs) well it's a it's a it's sort of an evolved society is what it is and and it's evolved to to kind of uh cut down the the tall poppies Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and I think it's so it's so interesting because we're seeing him in his earliest, and as he's kind of 
already very early pushing up against the 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 limitations or the the strictures of that society and then we kind of see him change himself and morph himself into a person that would fit better in it um and and then there's there's struggle there because it's not a perfect fit it doesn't work right he's he's trying to morph himself into the, the type of person that would slot perfectly in this kind of society and then he kind of ends bouncing off of it and and i think what, what he comes to realize is by the end of it is that like he believes in a lot of the ideas, right? The ideas are things that he believes in, but the ways in which the ideas have evolved over the course of the existence of the society have changed or, or, or naturally, or just through design in a way that pushes up against him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it, I, I, I like a lot of what you just said there, that the idea that he, he does, you know, it's not that he is this guy who flees from Anaris because he despises it because of how terrible it is. Mm -hmm. He is very much a person of Anaris. Yeah. Um, and even at the end, after he has all these terrible experiences on Urus, he's like, God, this place sucks. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, but I think, I think by that point he has come to have a bit more of a perspective on his home world mm -hmm. where he's not, you know, he, he sees a lot of the, the, the stuff that made his life difficult for what it is. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the yeah, the, that. the end of this book is definitely not, um, Adonian philosophy is shit actually. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. like he doesn't believe that it, it's not, it's also not like an anarchist society doesn't work. It uh, will be bad. It will be awful either. Like the, it's, I think any kind of definitive conclusion you want to make about any of these societies is probably going too far into into the definite than this book wants you to go mm -hmm. um well, yeah well that's i mean that again just to may, maybe at the risk of repeating myself like, like the idea that he is this poor fit for the society but but by virtue of having grown up in that society he is now of that society he can't just you know reject his lifetime of cultural upbringing and, and everything that it has shaped him into yeah totally um and and nor would he even want to, although, you know, maybe as a child, he's maybe the sort of person who would have thrived in a different society, one that would have recognized his gifts instead of telling him he was egoizing mm -hmm. um, and, and trying to basically stamp him out at every turn. Yeah. Um, you know, he might have thrived in a different society, but he grew up in this one and he can't go back. And I think that's a really, really yeah. unique thing. I, I don't think I've seen that particular idea in any other fiction that I can think of. So, yeah, I mean, it would definitely be a different book if, if he found a home in, an, in another society, right? Like mm -hmm. I think the, the recurring beat of this book is that the most important part of the journey is the return that you, like you can go out there, you can explore new things, see new things, but you like, this is, this is your home. It is, it was always going to be your home. Um, and like you are, you are part of the society, even if you don't fit perfectly into it. Yeah. I like that a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, Miss Evil Doom says that the, this introduction really made her hate the society. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. and yeah, I mean, I think you, you rubbed up against it. I, I was just like, Oh, yikes. Um, uh, but I think like this had a more visceral reaction for yeah. you. Well, the, there were, there were a few parts of the book where like, as we were getting into the book at this point in the book, my, my take was, okay. Uh, Le Guin is, is using a, using a character who likes this anarcho-communist society, but showing how terrible it actually is for him, and thus she's making us see, oh, this is actually terrible, and it's a it's a <laughs> it's a it's a, a jujitsu. But then, but that was just like my first like we're not very far into the book at all, right? Yeah. So that was like my first take of like, oh, she's trying to like get in past our guard, and it's like, well, yeah, that's one of the things she is doing, but she's also trying to. While she gets in past your guard on the left, she's also getting in past your guard on the right. So, <laughs> right, um, right, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, and as 567 is pointing out, that this this behavior that we see here is not some unique evil to Anaris, right? And I think that is important. That I think a lot of what this book is talking about is that these things, these, these uh, we can call them natural, like just being human, right? Like just these, these natural, like ingrained part of being a person um, spring up in any any formation in any civilization um mm -hmm. it's it's just a, a common yeah. truth and it, it, how how each society and and system treats those things are can vary but yeah yeah, yeah. Well, that's i mean i think we might get a chance to get to get to it later but like there it's clear that that people are competitive no matter what world they grow up on sure sure it's just 
how that competitiveness fits within the system, right? So, you know, he's not able to do his physics career the way he would want to because the guy who is superior to him, um, or they don't have superior, the guy who is <laughs> has seniority over him is making his life miserable. I mean, um, come on, the the guy that is superior, come on, come on, yeah, come on, right? But that, but you're not supposed to say that. <laughs> um, but then, but that, like, that's the thing is like. Like it's a, but it's an anarchist society. They can't, but it's like, no, like, like human nature is human nature. It, it just, <laughs> it takes different shapes depending on what the overriding structure is. And I think that's the yeah. coolest, I mean, in a, in a sentence, that's kind of the point of, of the, the book, right? Yeah. <laughs> Everyone's saying more central, not more superior. Central, yeah. more Sorry. Central. He's more central. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's so funny. <laughs> I love it. I love it. All right. Um, we go with this one. We've got yep. so many slides, so I think I Matt, Matt specifically said before we started, Scott, you pulled too much stuff. We got to go fast. And I laughed because yeah. that was a good joke. It was yeah, a good I joke, laughed Matt. too. Yeah. Um, all right. So now we're going to meet Shevik's friend, Tyrion, um, who is actually like a really fascinating case study throughout the book. And I kind of want to use, use this introduction slide to maybe talk about him just generally a little bit. So this is when they're still young and Tyrion is – they're a little bit older than the, the first scene, but, but Tyrion is kind of thinking about their society. If we're, better, if we're better than any other human society, said Tyrion, then we ought to be helping them. But we're forbidden to. Forbidden? Non-organic word. Who forbids? You're externalizing the integrative function itself, Shevik said, leaning forward and speaking with intensity. Order is not orders. We don't leave Anaris because we are Anaris. Being Tyrion, you can't leave Tyrion's skin. You might like to try being someone else to see what it's like, but you can't. But are you kept from it by force? Are we kept here by force? What force? What laws? Government? Police? None. Simply our own being, our nature as Adonians. It's your nature to be Tyrion, and my nature to be Shevik, and our common nature to be Adonians, responsible to one another. And that responsibility is our freedom. To avoid it would be to lose our freedom. Would you really like to live in a society where you had no responsibility and no freedom, no choice, only the false options of obedience to the law or disobedience followed by punishment? Would you really want to live in a prison? Oh, hell no. Can't I talk? <laughs> the trouble with you, Chef, is you don't say anything till you've saved a whole truckload of damned heavy brick arguments, and then you dump them all out and never look at the bleeding body mangled beneath the heap. Shevik sat back, looking vindicated. But Badap, a heavyset, square-faced fellow, chewed on his thumbnail and said, All the same, Tyr's point remains. It would be good to know that we knew all the truth about Eurus. Who do you think is lying to us? Shevik demanded. Placid, Badap met his gaze. Who, brother? Who but ourselves? The sister planet shone down upon them, serene and brilliant, a beautiful example of the improbability of the real. <laughs> it's great. It's really great. Yeah. So, I mean, basically, Shevik doing his thing where he, he goes on a tear and, you know, you're swept up in, in the, the logic of it. But I love I love that, like, the first, you know, uh, who is it? Tyrion says, like, oh, it's, you know, it, it's an inescapable argument, right? Mm -hmm. And then Badap just says, all the same, Tyr's point remains. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, like all that stuff you just said, it didn't really defeat what he was saying, mm -hmm. actually. It, it, it was it was pretty and it, and it was it, logically well formed in its way, but I don't think it actually um, I don't think it actually impinged on what he was saying, my my good friend. Yeah. Um, which is which is great, right? Um, uh, like that's I, I think we all know this person from high school who. <laughs> who was in who was in debate and who could yes. who could or who could construct an elaborate tower of, of logical arguments, but in the end kind of left you feeling like, yeah, but I don't think that actually means what you think it means. Um, yeah, I feel like which is I feel like who oh, young Shevy kids. Oh hell no, can't I talk is a, a <laughs> sentence I've said to that person multiple times. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> yes, debate bro. Exactly. We mm -hmm. all knew the debate bro. And and the thing I think I mean I think this it's intentional that you know we get to see this scene and then much later in the book uh Shevik becomes very well acquainted with the idea that uh you sort of are a prisoner to yourself yeah like yeah. Like, like like this this idea that they have freedom um well that they're sort of their own jailers actually yeah. yeah definitely and um i mean i i didn't pull it but the, the whole the whole interaction where they build the prison to try it and mm -hmm. see just see how psychologically it messes with the the jailers almost almost more we see the the psychological effect it has on the jailers more than it does on the on the prisoner um is is really powerful and and kind of relates to how you build your own prison around you and what that does to yourself um mm -hmm. and we'll get into that later in the other part that i think disturbed both of us as as uh husbands and parents 
Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I, I, I love this. I, I think, I think that the journey of Tyrion through this story is rather interesting because when next we see him or when we're told about him, he's in a uh, institution, right? Like he's voluntarily committed himself. Um, supposedly and yeah. then and then yeah like his it, like i think by the end of it like shevik has kind of come to realize at least in his opinion that society has just beaten the individual like individualism out of him which is i mean in in a sense the function of this society like mm-hmm. they are not the individual is not supposed to matter in this society it is all about it, it's ironic here that like being tier and you can't leave tier and skin is like like you are Tyrion, I am Shevik, we are Adonians, and I think the society would argue that that third one is way more important than the other two. Um, Mm -hmm. It is more important that you are an Adonian than it is that you are Shevik. And me as my my Western individualistic society grown-up person is like, -uh." (laughs) nah. I mean, we're that's I mean, it's interesting because, of course, everyone is shaped by their culture, but this is a culture that has a very explicit bent toward like oh we're gonna shape you all right Mm -hmm. you know we have have a very specific thing that we want to shape you into yeah um and yeah they they pay lip service to the idea that oh you can do whatever you want it's just that you won't get food (laughs) if you don't do what everyone else wants you to yeah that's Um, a very good point jake uh at the point of any society is to kind of beat the individual out of you um to to conform to the society's expectation of who who the who the individual is um, some more than others, I think, but I think that's generally true. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that's, that's true in a certain sense, but in, in another sense, there are some societies that are, that, that actually say, you know, that they notice the unique and the, the particular in the individual and they, mm-hmm. they try to, they try to recognize that and yeah. reward that. Um, and then yeah. there are societies that, that have an ethos of, um, of, you know, mocking and criticizing people who are exceptional and and that's a real thing on earth even but mm-hmm. i think i think it's yeah it's well it's well conveyed here yeah yeah and and what i like is like I, the book is not making a declarative statement on whether individuality or or you know uh, the group is better right like i mean there are advantages and disadvantages to both both yeah. both forms um right. i think too much of either when you start to get to the edges can be damaging. Yeah, and I think that's the way, I mean, we're, we may be getting ahead of the the book philosophically, but I think that's <laughs> one of the ways in which I kind of was, I kind of had to check myself because, because um, yeah, like we're, we're, we're the social animal, right? Like we, we don't do well when we are completely left, you know, without support. And we mm-hmm. also don't do well when we're, when everybody's in our damn face all the time telling us how to be. Um, I think I think we we actually do best in some kind of middle ground where, you know, you can you can go off and do your own thing. But then there's also a a society. Um, So and I think the book is sort of saying that. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Cool. Shall we move on? Yeah, let's do it. All right. So here we have uh, a, a study on how suffering is a misunderstanding. Suffering is a misunderstanding, Shevik said, leaning forward, his eyes wide and light. He was still lanking with with big hands, protruding ears, and angular joints, but in the perfect health and strength of early manhood, he was very beautiful. His dun-colored hair, like the others, was fine and straight, worn at its full length and kept off his forehead with a band. Only one of them wore her hair differently, a girl with high cheekbones and a flat nose. She had cut her dark hair in a shiny cap all around. She was watching Shevik with a steady, serious gaze. Her lips were greasy from eating fried cakes, and there was a crumb on her chin. It exists, Shevik said, spreading out his hands. It's real. I can call it a misunderstanding, but I can't pretend that it doesn't exist or will ever cease to exist. Suffering is the condition on which we live. And when it comes, you know it. You know it as the truth. Of course, it's right to cure diseases, to prevent hunger and injustice, as the social organism does. But no society can change the nature of existence. We can't prevent suffering. This pain and that pain, yes, but not pain. Society can only re- re- relieve social suffering, unnecessary suffering. The rest remains. The root, the reality. All of us here are going to know grief. If we live 50 years, we'll have known pain for 50 years, and then in the, in the end we'll die. That's the condition we're born to. I'm afraid of life. There are times I, I'm very frightened. Any happiness seems trivial. 
And yet I wonder if it isn't all a misunderstanding, this grasping after happiness, this fear of pain. If instead of fearing it and running from it, one could get through it, go beyond it. There is something beyond it. It's the self that suffers, and there's a place where the self ceases. I don't know how to say it. But I believe that the reality, the truth that I recognize in suffering as I don't in comfort and happiness, that the reality of pain is not pain. If you can get through it, if you can endure it all the way. The reality of our life is in love, in solidarity, said a tall, soft-eyed girl. Love is the true condition of human life. Adap shook his head. No, Chev's right, he said. Love's just one of the ways through, and it can go wrong and miss. Pain never misses. But, therefore, we don't have much choice in endu about enduring it. We will, whether we want to or not. <laughs> Life is pain. Anyone who says otherwise is selling something. Uh -huh. um, this is such an interesting little monologue of his here, because, like, I, it's, it's true, <laughs> I guess. Like, the idea that, like, you can you can prevent this suffering and this suffering, but like pain as a general concept is unpreventable is true. But I don't like, I don't know if he's actually reaching a conclusion here. Yeah. I feel like this connects to something that crops up later in the book that I, at this exact second can't uh, make the connection to. Um, but yeah, it's interesting that, that here he's, he's sort of elevating pain and suffering to being this, this almost like spiritual, status um, yeah i mean we, we kind of had to cut it out because it was getting too long but i think his conclusion on this whole thing is that um pain is everything and the only way to get through pain is through community and that's what this our society does right that, that like like we share our pain we all the the thing that collectively binds us together is the fact that we all suffer um mm -hmm. inescapably and and that is that is kind of our binding force that um uh yeah yeah so yeah, I think that's right. I, I think I think that's the the point of this. The, another thing that I noticed, and and you know, people earlier in the chat were talking about how this movie compare, how this book compares to Stranger in a Strange Land, mm -hmm. which I read so long ago, I don't really remember the details other than that it is about a character who is you know out of place on a different world. Um, but but the the comparison I kept making was actually, and this will surprise no one, to Dune. Um, <laughs> Because these people, they live on, an, on a very kind of inhospitable world. It's not as bad as Arrakis. Uh, it's not as bad as Dune is. But, mm -hmm. um, but, cle but clearly it's, it's a case of like the hardship and just like the physical requirement of, of living on this hell world pushes everyone into a situation where like you don't have the option of not being a collectivist because you have no resources. Yeah, there, yeah. There's no base upon which to build capital. <laughs> and so capitalism is impossible. You're, you're scrounging, you're, you're constantly scrounging for survival. Um, and, and that's very much like in Dune. I mean, the, the Fremen, they're never really called collectivist and the story doesn't make a point of, you know, what political system the Fremen use. It's just, they're, uh, they're, they're, they're scraping by. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think their society is a lot like the society actually. And I think it's by necessity. Right. And it's yeah. no, it's no big, you know, um, uh, 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 amazing thing to point out that you know the the sister planet is this paradise and it's like well they're a paradise so they have an excess of resources when you have an excess of resources there is just a kind of natural tendency for resources to accumulate in some places and not others and 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 for people to, to build ever greater piles of resources and hoard yeah and and so like it's it's a direct consequence i think at least in part of the literal like ecology of their worlds leads them to living these uh these lives that they do. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely a, a distinctive purposeful choice to set the utopia on a place that is, is, is that, that existence in itself is hard and that like, um, there aren't, there aren't enough resources. Like they're entirely dependent on, on, on Eurus for, for trade and in, in, in a lot of ways. Right. And they, mm -hmm. I mean, they have this kind of central computer system that I think when this book was written was probably like, beyond what any, anything that existed um, that kind of helps helps create helps organize their society and make it possible I think the book even explicitly says that like this would not have been possible without this cent this computer system right mm -hmm. um, yeah the, the computer thing it, it, it was kind of interesting how it would crop up here and there and, and I, I was wondering if the book was going to go a direction where it was like this this AI system or whatever is actually some kind of 
you know, it's 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 pulling the strings behind the scenes, right? Because um, there were these implications that like people would just, by coincidence, not end up with work postings that would actually put them near <laughs> loved ones. And it's like, it, yeah, I was like, oh, is the is the is the computer system like trying to break up personal personal relationships and family relationships so that you know, like is it intentionally doing that so that everyone feels that they're um that, that you know they're uh, that their neighbor is is you know j- just like the the other citizens are all they can count on they can't count on specific people but they can count on the people um i mean i thought the book actually kind of did imply that it didn't it never really came to the point of saying of uh coming right out and saying it mm-hmm. yeah yeah i mean i think it, w- it would have been a different <laughs> it's just like it's such a choice like you could have you could have said okay we're gonna dump this utopian anarchistic society on a on a place with a with a, the an abundance of resources, right? Mm-hmm. And and that would be, I think, a different examination. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think, um, I think, I think, I think I know where that would go. Honestly, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, I think that's one of the things that the story is exploring. Like, like, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. I, I don't know where it would go. Um, yeah, I mean, I th- I think that like my the, the the thing that I'm taking away from this book in a big way. I'm I'm sort of reacting to what's happening in the chat, although I can't react in a l- level of detail because it's <laughs> happening so fast. It's just like I, I've sort of, I'm I'm like much less using words like capitalism and communism in my thinking about these things because the book does such a good job of pointing out like, oh, this is just human nature. Human nature is going to human nature whether you have a capitalistic culture or a communistic culture. Or, or uh, you know, it, it's it has much more to do with just like what are individuals going to do in specific situations given um, given the the um, incentives, right? And that's sure. Yeah, I think there's an argument for that. Yeah, um, I'm not sure. Like, I don't, I don't like how much. Like, it gets you to an argument of how much is human nature and how much is societally defined. Um, belief system and I think that's one thing the, the book is really diving into right mm-hmm. um, that we it is it is attempting to to kind of suss out the difference between what is this what is a, a, a what is behavior that is conditioned by the society you grew up and what is behavior that is just natural to people mm-hmm. um, and yeah. I mean I do think there are ways in which we we do kind of see that this society, like you said earlier, competition, um, bargaining, like they don't have money, but there is bargaining that goes on between characters on, mm-hmm. on an Aris. Um, there, there is, there is these tendencies that seep in. We, we, they call them different things. They refer to them different ways, but they do seep in. Um, yeah, they're not, they're not supposed to have people who are like more important to them. You know, you're, you're not supposed to have the mother child relationship yeah. and, and the, the father child relationship and the husband wife relationship. But they make it clear repeatedly that like Shevik's mother and Shevik are both like horribly scarred by the fact that she, that like she was sort of prevented from being able to be his mother, right? Yeah, um, yeah. And and similarly, he is is you know uh, miserable because he basically misses his his child's entire you know young childhood. Um, and, and, and it's, you know, again, this is all, I think, I think what you said a second ago about behavior is it's like, well, the society does successfully shape his behavior. He willfully, uh, willingly leaves his child. You know, he, he could yeah. go to his child at any time. The book is very clear that he could go and really what would happen? He'd probably get some, some frowns and some, some disapproval, but he could do it. Mm-hmm. Um, but he chooses not to because he's internalized. Um, the judgment. And so it's, sh- it's shaped his behavior, even though on the inside, it causes him a ton of suffering. Yeah. And so I, I think like, again, it's the same thing where like every, every human wants these same things, but absolutely the society can shape your behavior regardless of what you want and, you know, how much it hurts you. Yeah. I like that because one of the things I was doing and we're, we're, we're all over the place now, which yeah. is fine. I think this yeah. is just going to be a free flowing conversation regardless of what slide we're on. I, I like, I was looking at, I was like, I was looking at the the idea of being separated from your loved ones, um, the mm-hmm. idea of having your mother not not ever knowing your mother because she was sent away on a posting, and and then you know turning around and and falling in love and and having a partnership and having a kid and then being separated from them. And I was looking at my kind of horrified reaction to like to to, to feeling guilt 
about wanting to be with my child. Um, and, and it's, it's guilt by, I mean, it's, they don't call it guilt. It's different, but, and I was like, is this, am I, am I reacting this way because of the place that I grew up and, and the, the values that were instilled upon me by the society I live in? And that's certainly true. I, I, it, it, it's inescapable. Like, of course I was, but I, I do think that the choice to show still that in this society, this man that grew up in the society feels those things does, does trend some universality to it. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, I would call the parent-child relationship a universal. I, I would call the desire to, to compete for social status a universal. I, I, don't, I think you can stamp out the behavioral manifestation, but I don't think you can stamp out the desire, right? And mm-hmm. that's, that's where the suffering comes from, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's uh, to, to return to the slide that we've been on for 18 <laughs> minutes. Um, um, like, like that's exa- I think that's what they're talking about here, because a lot of their suffering is caused because they live on a hell planet. But a lot of their suffering is actually caused because of the restrictions of their society. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, yeah. OK, let's let's move on, because I think a lot of these things are going to come up again anyway. So, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Cool. Um, all right. So this slide is, is another little, I feel like we've been, we're going to, we're going to spend some time on Eurus, I promise, but <laughs> this is another Anaris slide. Uh, since he was very young, he had known that in certain ways he was unlike anyone else he knew. For a child, the consciousness of such difference is very painful since having done nothing yet and being incapable of doing anything, he cannot justify it. The reliable and affectionate presence of adults who are also in their own way different is the only reassurance such a child can have. And Shevik had not had it. His father had indeed been utterly reliable and affectionate. Whatever Shevik was and whatever he did, Pallet approved and was loyal. But Pallet had not had this curse of difference. He was like the others, like all the others to whom community came so easy. He loved Shevik, but he could not show him what freedom is, that recognition of each person's solitude which alone transcends, transcends it. Shevik was therefore used to an inward isolation, buffered by all the daily casual contacts and exchanges of communal life, and by the companionship of a few friends. Here in Ab- Abene, he had no friends, and because he was not thrown into the dormitory situation, he made none. He was too conscious, at twenty, of the peculiarities of his mind and character to be outgoing. He was withdrawn and aloof, and his fellow students, sensing that aloofness was real, did, often, did not often try to approach him. The privacy of his room soon became dear to him. He savored his total independence. He left the room only for breakfast and dinner at the refectory, and daily and quick daily hike through the city streets to appease his muscles, which had always been used to exercise, then back to room 46 and the grammar of Iotic. Once every decade or two, he was called on for 10th day rotational community labor, but the people he worked with were strangers, not close acquaintances, and as they would have been in a small community. So these days of manual work made no psychological interruption to his isolation or to his project in I- progress in Iotic. So here again, I think this is the text, like where the book comes right out and says, this guy different. <laughs> mm-hmm. he's, he's, he doesn't he's, fit. Yeah, he, he, doesn't, he doesn't fit in and, and he's aware of it. And, uh, and other, other people are, are aware of it too. Um, I mean, at a certain point, I think he does, he does start to, to fit. He starts to make himself fit, but he's yeah, still a young yeah. man here. Right. I think it, it's after he, his, he gets sick in his interaction with his mother, right. Um, mm-hmm. that he, he like redoubles his effort to become part of the community. Um, interesting. Yeah. I didn't make that connection, but I think you're right. So does the book ever come right out and say that, that a decade is just a 10 day unit of time? Or are are we left to pick that up on our own? I mean, I I assume like every decade he was called for a tenth day says like yeah makes that textual um, sure. But I mean, it uses the term decade a, a lot and yeah. in, in in various contacts uh, contexts. Matt, and, that uh, means I, that means ten, Matt. I, I just thought it was great because it does. It obviously means ten, but <laughs> but it, it, it's it's the perfect it's the perfect thing for the society where it's like they ripped out all of the software of the society they came from down to we don't use weeks anymore we use decades mm-hmm. right we don't use whatever you know we we, we, we we're, we're using the metric system damn it we're using <laughs> metric weeks yeah fuck um, america <laughs> I, just, yeah, I just i mean exactly like like yes exactly yeah, that yeah. like like we're we're, we're uh you know it, this is a rational unit of time okay and, uh, <laughs> I, I thought that was yeah. i thought that was really fun i just just as a very small very very small world building touch i just love the idea of a decade instead of 
you know, a week. Yeah, um, I mean, it's like when early America, like, specifically changed how we spell certain words or, or made the different spelling from the British spelling, the the definitive spelling specifically to I, to differentiate ourselves from yeah. from the United Kingdom or from yeah. Britain. Yeah, totally. Uh, yeah. It's, it's such, I mean, it's such a small world building touch, really, but, like, I, it's so rich to me. It's yeah. so much richer than, you know, some made up word, right? I, I think we've, like, and and I, I don't, I don't think this is a mistake we've made, um, but I think we've like di- like dove into the philosophy of this book so much that yeah we're kind of passing by the wonderful little like narrative touches that she's doing, uh-huh. which is that kind of world building that she she has basically created an entire world that exists on this moon that is unlike anything I've ever really experienced. I I do think it's this this wonderful exercise in world building where I I, I wonder like. I like to romanticize the writing process sometimes. And and so I wonder if like she sat down and, and, and was not sure what kind of story she was going to tell when she started writing it, like sitting down and saying, I am going to make an anarchistic society. And, and then she just kind of felt her way through what would happen in that society, mm-hmm. what that would look like and, and the good things about it and the, and the, the sense of community and the fact that, you know, that this, this wonderful sentence, like, like, uh, when we starve, we starve together. When we, we eat, we eat together. Like the, that, that, that whole thing. And then like mm-hmm. these things that like inspire you and like, yeah, like we're a team. We're, we're, we're suffering together and we're, we're succeeding together. And it's this, this wonderful sense of community. And then the, how, how we can demonstrate maybe what the bad parts of that. And, and I, I love this idea that maybe she didn't know what that was going to look like until she started actually writing it. I don't, I have no way of knowing whether that's true or not. Uh, it just kind of feels like it. Um, mm-hmm. so, and, like that's, and, and the world building is so passionate. It feels like one of these things that might've been written as like a series of, of short stories, exploring a concept and then kind of gelled over time. Just, I, I don't know if that's true or not. If, if anybody in the chat knows kind of how this book is written, I'd be interested to know that. Yeah. Um, yeah. cause it just, it, it, like you said, there's, it it seems it seems simple on the surface, but the more you kind of look at it and and think about it, like the the kind of deeper and more thought out it obviously is. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I, I love Quantum's point here that they don't have the concept of a weekend because <laughs> there is no distinction between work and play in the society. There's not even uh-huh. a, a different word for it, which is wonderful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we haven't even like talked on the fact that their their language is is was developed in a way that like basically no other language spoken um <laughs> is developed right it yeah. was developed with a goal in mind yeah, like it it's was a conlang yeah yeah, yeah. um I, I know there are like some I, there's that's not like the first time that's been done in books and and i know there's societies that have invented their own language and stuff like that but yeah, to see it fully realized in this way where like the reason why there's no difference between work and play was a conscious choice made by the creator of the language right yeah 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 exactly the people earlier were talking about um the idea that like the the the, the language itself sort of puts like ex quote-unquote excremental connotations on um on concepts that they don't want people to you know like yeah yeah you know like, like you're you're literally supposed to associate you know greed with fecal matter and, yeah and, yeah uh, things along these lines yeah right right well and i love like like when he fe- the shevik's reaction to feeling greedy in one moment is to say i'll i'll leave i'll leave greed to 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 the um uh, i just forgot the the cool word the, that they the made up the proprietarians thank you yeah. like i'll leave greed to the proprietarians but like or guilt he says i'll leave guilt to the proprietarians because guilt is but like i don't know i feel like they just feel guilty and don't call it guilt Yes. Oh, oh, oh that certainly. Yes. <laughs> I mean, I mean, the book has. I forget what part exactly, but I remember there was some part where, like, he says that, but then it's it's like it's just so clear that he can't escape the guilt, right? Mm-hmm. It, it's like it, it's not a magical it's not a magical thing that's gonna uh, uh, prevent him from ever having to feel the things that he doesn't want to feel. Yeah. It's, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, shall we move on? Yeah. Let's do it. Let's talk about uh, Soviet Union. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so, yes, here we go. Are you also an agent of your government? Jafoilisk's face closed down. Then he turned suddenly to Shevik, speaking softly and with hatred. Yes, he said. Of course I am. If I weren't, I wouldn't be here. Everyone knows that. My government sends abroad only men whom it can trust. 
and they can trust me because I haven't been bought like all these damn rich Lodi professors. Sorry, sorry, EOD professors. I believe in my government, in my country. I have faith in them. He forced his words out in a kind of tor torment. You've got to look around you, Shevik. You're a child among thieves. They're good to you. They give you a nice room, lectures, students, money, tours of castles, tours of model factories, visits to, to pretty villages, all the best, all lovely, fine. But why? Why do they bring you here from the moon, praise you, print your books, keep you safe and snug in the lecture rooms and laboratories and libraries? Do you think they do it out of scientific disinterest, out of brotherly love? This is a profit economy, Shevik. I know. I came to bargain with it. Bargain? What? For what? Shevik's face had taken on the cold, grave look it had worn when it left the fort in Drio. You know what I want, Shefoyisk. I want my people to come out of exile. I came here because I don't think you want that in two. You were afraid of us there. You fear we might bring back the revolution, the old one, the real one, the revolution for justice, which you began and then stopped halfway. Here in Ao, Ao, yeah, Ao, they fear me less because they they have forgotten the the yeah, they have forgotten the revolution. They don't believe in it anymore. They think if people they think if people can possess enough things, they will be content to live in prison. But I will not believe that. I want to I want the walls down. I want solidarity, human solidarity. I want free exchange between Urus and Anaris. I worked for it as I could on Anaris. Now I work for it as I can on Urus. There, I acted. Here, I bargain. With what? Oh, you know, Chafoilisk, Chevik said in a, in a low voice with diffidence. You know what it is they want from me. Dormammu, I come to bargain. That's all I could think of when, I, when you were reading that. That's all yep. I could think of. And because time is a loop, he's just gonna say it over and over uh -huh. again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So obviously, like, like the, again, like we talk about, the book never says the word capitalist. Um, but there's obviously this very clear, um, AIO is the United States. Um, uh, Thu is Soviet Russia, and they engage in a cold war over over a revolution in a country. Right. Like it's just very. It's just, it's just very like that's the most I think directly allegorical Le Guin gets in the story, mm -hmm. um, which is an interesting choice, right? Um, especially because at the end we meet someone from Terra, and and um, we see that like the, the that the real Earth that exists in this thing is a fucking hellhole. Um, so it's yeah, it, but I don't know. I th I thought it was very interesting the 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 way the book is critical of what Thu is, um, and it, like. I think it would have been very easy to make, to be to make this simple and just have like Eurus is a planet of propertarianism and and Anaris is is not and the, the fact that the the story chose to say no this is a, a world with different competing ideologies amongst them um, we're going to complicate like this this the 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 general idea that none of this is going to be simple we're going to complicate this we're I, 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 Ursula K. Le Guin, am not like like declaring things orderly with with my simplicity in this. I'm mm -hmm. trying to make it complicated, and and I, I just found that fascinating that there's these two societies in here and they're competing, and and one of them like like one of them looks at Chevik and says, "You're more like me." Like we're we're closer together than these guys, and he's like, "No, you worship the state and law like more than I more than these people do." Right. <laughs> yeah, that, that's one thing. I mean, it, it it's it's the book is definitely talking about capitalism and communism, but it's mm -hmm. also talking about statism and anarchism. Yeah, and these yeah. these all these people are statists, and I almost feel like it's more fundamental to being you know from an artist that you're an anarchist and not a statist than that you're a communist and not a capitalist. I mean, yeah. they, they care about both. Yes. Yeah. But, but the, 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 he, he's, he's basically, uh, similarly offended by the, the statists in both cases. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, like I came here because your people fear me more than they do. Like, and I love yeah. that, like you, the revolution for justice, which you began and then stopped halfway is such yeah. a dig, <laughs> such yeah. a dig. So I, I meant I meant to look into this in more detail before the, the book club. So I'm going to have to do my best here. But it's interesting because I'm pretty sure, might be wrong, pretty sure that when this book, this book came out in 1974, mm -hmm. pretty sure that at, in, a, in around 1974, um, Americans really did not know 
um, about sort of the worst of the atrocities of what the Soviet Union had done. They didn't know about the gulags. They didn't know about the tyranny of Stalin. Um, th- there was there was sort of a, a much more um, pretty picture that had been painted of of what the Soviet Union was like, which was of course you know, of course that's what that's what a, a country is going to do. It's going to put out propaganda. Yeah. Um, and <clears throat> you know, I, I, I just looked this up while we were talking, the dispossessed came out in 74, the Gulag archipelago came out in 73. And I think it still had to be translated into English. So it would be a stretch to assume that Le Guin had, yeah, in fact, it was only published in English in 74. So it would be a stretch to assume that Le Guin had read that. And, it, but, but anyway, yeah, uh, John is saying it was published the same year. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, that's crazy. But the uh, but so, so like I'm, I'm only really bringing this up to say that I actually give her even kind of more credit because she was writing this in a world where um, it actually seemed really plausible that you could have a communist utopia in ways where it seems much less plausible um, now. Mm-hmm. Um, but but I think that she still kind of think like she thinks it through in a way that is nonetheless logical and coherent and makes sense. And I like at no point am I like, oh, well, you know, she was mistaken because she didn't know. It's like, well, no, she 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 thought of everything that she needed to think of to make the story work and to make the ideas come together. And I just thought that was really, um, really cool. I just I thought I thought it important to place the the story in terms of um, its time. Yeah, Um, that's a good point. I hadn't I hadn't lined up the dates like that. Um, Cool. Do we want to move on or let's, anything want to say more about this? Um, all right. So let's talk about art on Anaris. I think this is really interesting and I want to spend some time on it. The concerts, they were a revelation, a shock of joy. He had never gone to a concert here in Abenay, partly because he thought of music as something you do rather than something you hear. As a child, he had always sung or played one instrument or another in local choirs and ensembles. He had enjoyed it very much, but he had not had much talent, and that was all he knew of music. Learning centers taught all the skills that prepare for the practice of art, training in singing, metrics, dance, the use of brush, chisel, knife, knife, lathe, and so on. It was all pragmatic. The children learned to see, speak, hear, move, handle. No distinction was drawn between the arts and the crafts. Art was not considered as having a place in life, but as being a basic technique of life, like speech. Thus, architecture had developed early and freely as a consistent, a consistent style, pure and plain, subtle in proportion. Painting and sculpture served largely as elements of architecture and town planning. As for the arts of words, poetry, and story tending, telling tended to be ephemeral to be linked with song and dancing only the theater stood wholly alone and only the theater was ever called the art a thing completely it's in itself there were many regional and traveling troops of actors and dancers repertory companies very often with playwright attached they performed tragedies semi-improvised comedies mimes they were as welcome as rain in the lonely desert towns they were in the glory of the year whenever wherever they came rising out of and embodying the isolation and communality of the anaresti spirit the drama had attained extraordinary power and brilliance this uh i i i love this i mean this is like yeah. like like you know we're talking about we, we've highlighted the ways in which Le Guin is talking about the negative sides of of this this kind of lifestyle right i i loved this side of it like this 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 idea of a society that just like is we're gonna teach you all this stuff and it's like, I mean, you just think about how, how much schools in our country struggle with the arts, right? And, and funding for the arts. And it's just, this was just a, a part of life here. Um, yeah, no, I think, I think it's beautiful. I mean, it's, it's beautifully written and it conveys like, I, I don't know, just like you can't kind of, you can't help but smile reading this. Yeah. Just kind of imagining a world where this is true. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. A, a world where, where children are taught, are taught to do art, um, because it is it is it is considered a modality of living right uh, right and uh and the i mean the the less charitable side of myself before it, had you told me about the concept of this world would have said well certainly in this in this world where um function and and necessity are everything like we would have just stamped out the arts and and it's the exact opposite right it's it's different it doesn't look mm-hmm. the same but they recognize the the importance of this stuff. This is a, it's a fundamental truth of humanity that like art 
creation um, is is something we all want to do, and and it seems to flourish in this society. Yeah. And I just I loved it. I absolutely loved it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you if you sort of see their their anarchist society as something that that evolved through, you know, through natural selection, where the, the what what people do is is sort of defined by what people will you know, d- demand, um, and, and want to see done, then you see like the, the human nature demands art. That's, that, that does seem to be one of the fundamental things about us. Um, and, and if, if there were no art, then people would feel a need to make it, I think. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. And I mean, it, it does make sense that like the, uh, the art architecture, like the art of things on the society is very functional architecture, like mm-hmm. stuff we need, um, but the that that the the performance art is not like like we, it would be so contrary to have like these exquisite paintings everywhere right but dancing words poetry these things that are not owned that are are kind of shared freely it just makes perfect sense in this society mm-hmm. yeah that's that's cool um there's uh uh Daniel in the uh, in the chat is 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 commenting on the um the blanket that uh uh that they what was this like the orange blanket right mm-hmm. yeah, yeah they, they had the, Shevik there was a blanket there and it was like their one their one thing their <laughs> one then, thing that, that they cared about yeah which they couldn't keep of course because yeah. it's not really theirs yeah um yeah I mean that's the the, the uh the uh i don't know like that 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 feels like such a symbol right <laughs> like if you're writing your english essay the 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 orange blanket is such oh, a yeah. powerful symbol of yeah. of like um cuz 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 daniel is is basically saying um it it seems weird to have a society without craft and and now i'm i'm kind of thinking like well if you if you sort of don't really if you sort of get looked down on for identifying with the things that you're crafting then i think maybe you just have much less of a, of a motivation to ever make things um and maybe that's part of it i don't but know like I, I don't know blankets are pretty functional yeah yeah but, <laughs> but, but, but like that's the idea is like the blanket just gets left with the room it's like you're not supposed to i, I guess i forget exactly what the rules are about like possess like you're, you're not supposed to have things right mm-hmm. you're not supposed to you're not supposed to own things yeah but like i don't know like there's there's some things some things you just like a like a blanket <laughs> But they leave it. They leave the blanket behind. The person who made it left it, and then they leave it, even though it was this special blanket. Yeah, but do, doesn't he get chastised at some point for still having the blanket? Yeah, it sounds familiar. I don't remember exactly, but still, it's a symbol. It's a symbol. <laughs> I mean, it definitely is. Like, I think you're absolutely right that some some high school English teacher like would say, talk about a symbol in this story, um, yeah. and they're they're totally wanting you to to go for the blanket. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah. See, uh, John is pointing out that the, okay. the the mistake he makes with the blanket is that he's taking it okay. with him. So I so I was I was wrong, but also right at the same time. Mm-hmm. He but, David's saying he does get chastised for it being in his room at all. Yeah, yeah. That's true. Yeah, I lo- I love. I don't know if we're going to talk about it, but I love the woman who clearly wants to use the room that he. <laughs> that he was in and it's yeah. just being super annoying about it yeah, well because you can't you can't just say that right because yeah, yeah. you can't want that yeah no yeah. it's great all right every uh, this, this is this is a hard book club scott because i want to talk about every slide for 15 minutes and know, everybody man. in the chat wants to talk about every slide for 15 minutes i know man um but i think we should move on but don't worry every single one of the slides that i have left is filled to the brim of words because there's so much stuff I figured, yeah. <laughs> All right, so here we have the Cold War analog that's that's happening on this planet and Shevik's growing dis- disgust for the Erasti people. The Vinbili revolutionaries were mostly not even armed. The Iote troops would come with guns, armored cars, airplanes, bombs. Shevik read the description of their equipment in the paper and felt sick at his stomach. He felt sick and enraged, and there was nobody he could talk to. Pei was out of the question. Atro was an ardent militarist. Oye was an ethical man, but his private insecurities, his his anxieties as a property owner, made him cling to rigid notions of law and order. He could cope with his personal liking for Shevik only by refusing to admit that Shevik was an anarchist. The Odonian society called itself anarchistic, he said, 
but they were in fact mere primitive populists whose social order functioned without apparent government because there were so few of them and because they had no neighbor states. <laughs> when their property was threatened by an aggressive rival, they would wake up. They would either wake up to reality or be wiped out. The Benbili rebels were waking up to reality now. They were finding freedom is not good if you have no guns to back it up. He explained this to Shevik in the one discussion they had on the subject. It did not matter who governed or thought they governed the Benbilis. The politics of reality concerned the power struggle between Ayo and Thu. The politics of reality, Shevik repeated. He looked at Oye and said, that is a curious phrase for a physicist to use. Not at all. The, po the politician and the physicist both deal in things as they are, with real forces, the basic laws of the world. You put your petty, miserable laws to protect your wealth, your forces of guns and bombs in the same sentence with the law of entropy and the force of gravity? I thought better of your mind, Demar. Oye shrank from, from that thunderbolt of contempt. <laughs> he said no more, and Shevik said no more, but Oye never forgot. It lay embedded in his mind thereafter as the most shameful moment of his life. For if Shevik, the deluded and simple-minded utopist, utopist, had silenced him so easily, that was shameful. But if Shevik, the physicist, and the man who he could not help liking, admiring, so that he longed to, to deserve his respect, as if it were somehow a finer grade of respect than any currently available elsewhere. If this Shevik despised him, then the shame was intolerable, and he must hide it, lock it away, the rest of his life, in the darkest room of his soul. <laughs> <laughs> I love this so much, man. Uh, I mean, Shevik. not only is the the writing just, like, uh, it's so good, but, I mean, like, I think I think this is such a fascinating exploration of of Uris, of this this concept of like the worship of law right like I, I do think it's a little absurd to call like the laws of the world that they live on and the basic laws the fundamental cornerstones of our universe as like the same thing uh-huh yeah that's that's great. I, I, I just love that he, d he destroyed this man's mind with yeah, his yeah with his uh, with his dig. I, I, I like I like Jake S. Uh, yeah. Jake's Jake's comment that uh, uh, Le Guin is actually in 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 very close third person for most of the book, but there's a few places like right here in this passage that she um, we jump over to Oye's mind and we do more of a of a limited um, somewhat omniscient. Um, yeah, yeah, we get. I mean, we get to see him far into the future, and and yeah, I I think it is cool when she detaches from the characters like that, and she does it again. Um, she does it multiple times throughout the book, um, and there it's very targeted moments, um, and stuff like this. But yeah, yeah, I mean, like it's so it's so it's so absurd to me to look at this look at this this struggle between these two superpowers and how they're they're doling it out on this this third smaller country just struggling to redefine itself and and define what freedom is for itself and just say oh these people they just don't understand what what the politics of reality are it's just like i don't know maybe maybe in the in the 70s like we hadn't got to a point where ever like the the general feeling was absolute disgust at that kind of a uh, treatment of a, an independent people that are just trying to do their own thing but man i was just like that's that's disgusting yeah i mean basically it's vietnam right yeah it's, yeah. it's funny that i didn't make the connection that it was vietnam until yeah. until now um mm -hmm. but yeah it's it's vietnam <laughs> yeah it's it's 100 percent. like yeah. how how much into, or maybe when did, Korea, we, when did, we, when did we get out of vietnam we got out of vietnam in 75 okay so this is right yeah so the, that's definitely a reflecting of probably what what the general American consensus was at the time that yeah. people were disgusted by this kind of behavior. Yeah. Yeah. I can, uh, I can, I can imagine Le Guin <laughs> just, just being unable to resist putting in the Vietnam analog. It's yeah. Yeah. I mean, like you put your petty, like I don't agree with Shevik about everything he says and I don't, I don't know if Le Guin wants you to, but you put your petty miserable laws to protect wealth, your forces of guns and bombs in the same sentence with the law of entropy and the force of gravity is such a fucking great sentence, right? It's so great. Like, yeah. like, I, and I think this is, this is what happens. This is like, you just make the assumption that like, the way you have constructed things is the only way it works. Mm -hmm. um, and you just make that assumption. And it, yeah, well, I mean, it's a scathing indictment of the way we always talk about this stuff too. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, unfortunately, even now we still use 
you know, we still talk about like natural law and yeah. stuff where, yeah. where, you know, but political scientists are very, very political scientists, politicians, economists, like, like really all of the people with the power still tend to talk in terms of, you know, the, the, the inevitability of mm-hmm. political, um, of political reality. Yeah. Political reality. The politics of reality. The politics of reality is such a good term. Yeah. Cause like, what does that mean really? Yeah. Which is especially funny now, now that like it's evident that technology always trumps politics and will continue to do so. <laughs> but uh, that's a tangent. Mm-hmm. Yeah, don't get, right. don't get off on your tangents, Matt. I know, I know exactly it's, where you would spend the next hour yeah. talking about. Scott, there's no, there's no way you can keep me on topic for this, for this <laughs> book club. I'm sorry. I mean, I, I, I have, I, I've done a, I've done a poor job so far. Yeah. I don't think it's getting any better from here. Yeah. I mean, I do think I do. Th- that's a really great point, Jake. And I think that, you know, I think that is, that is something that could be said on both sides of this whole thing. Um, that there is this, this tendency to just go, well, this is just the way it is. Um, and there is, there's so much failure ingrained in that, right? That's like, it's just, it's just the right the way the way it is. Yeah, yeah, it's just, just the way it is because it's convenient the, for us. Yeah, to, it's just the way it that. is because I don't actually feel like changing it. Yeah, Sorry. right. <laughs> it's it's a law. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I someone um, someone mentioned this earlier, but I, I do think it's it's the, the, a fascinating way in which we kind of equate law with moral, right? Like, and and. I don't want to spend too much time on this because God, we've been talking forever, but um, <laughs> I, like the way we construct laws is almost like, especially in America, like the, the constitution is basically supposed to be a document that limits what the government is allowed to do. Right. And then mm-hmm. if it's not there, people are free to do whatever. That's the point. Um, mm-hmm. And so like, it doesn't, I just like law as a gauge of morality doesn't, doesn't work under that system because like it uh, you you need some societal pressure there i think Mm -hmm. and and of course and we do have it right like our our moral system is not controlled just by what our laws say i don't think it's this it's the case on urus it's certainly not the case on anaris right yeah sure i mean it it, that's interesting because we also we also have our institutional religion where we get a lot of our morality from right Mm -hmm. and that has Mm -hmm. its own separate laws right which we call we call something different but they're yeah you know in in fact we also say that the the laws of religion are are uh are are immutable uh uh you know yeah yeah eternal (laughs) <laughs> the dispossessed is things they don't have to be the way they are the book yeah that's very true i mean that's kind of that's kind of what shevik's conclusion is on on even um anaris right is that mm-hmm. like we were revolutionaries and we we had this revolution we moved to this new place we defined this new society and then we got we got a little <laughs> we got we got a little comfortable um relatively comfortable it's a tough place to live and there's a lot of suffering there yeah we got a little comfortable in the way things worked and and when revolutionaries pop up in our society we kind of kind of push them away <laughs> uh-huh. i mean that um, it, isn't that hilarious that our main character is a guy who was such an oddball that he th- threw a, a a revolution on his anarchist planet yeah <laughs> A revolution in only the the way an anarchist could, which is just like, I'm gonna do whatever I want. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah, you, you can't stop me. Yeah, I mean, and what he was doing was revealing, you know, hey, you 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 have these cultural structures that are just as much structures as the things that you claim to mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. to be criticizing. Yeah. So. All right, let's talk cool. about Chevik's debate with Vea. Is that how? It's pronounced, I forget actually what her name is. It started with a V. I, it's not in this quote, so I didn't remember it. I don't know. I don't remember. I bet Jake knows. It's, Via sounds right. It's his favorite book. But my society, he said, completely puzzled. It's an attempt to reach it, to throw out the moralizing yes, the rules, the laws, the punishments, so that men can see good and evil and choose between them. So you threw out all the do's and don'ts, but you know, I think you Odonians miss the whole point. You threw out the priests and judges and divorce laws and all that, but you kept the real trouble behind them. You just stuck it inside, into your consciousness. But it's still there. You're just as much slaves as ever. You aren't really free. How do you know? 
I read an article in a magazine about Adonism, <laughs> she said, and we've been together all day. I don't know you, but I know some things about you. I know that you've got a, a Queen Tiea inside you, right inside that hairy head of yours, and she orders you around just like the old tyrant did her serfs. She says, do this, and you do. Don't, and you don't. That is where she belongs, he said, smiling, inside my head. No, better than than better to have her in a palace. Then you could rebel against her. You would have. You would have. Your great-great-grandfather did. At least he ran off to the moon to get away. But he cook, took Queen Tiao with him, and you've still got her. Maybe. But she has learned, on Anaris, that if she tells me to hurt another person, I hurt myself. The same old hypocrisy. Life is a fight, and the strongest wins. All civilization does is hide the blood and cover up the hate with pretty words. Your civilization, perhaps. Ours hides nothing. It is all plain. Queen Tiea wears her own skin there. We follow one law, only one. The law of human evolution. The law of evolution is that the strongest survives. Yes, and the strongest in the existence of any social species are those who are most social, in human terms, most ethical. You see, we have neither prey nor enemy on Anaris. We have only one another. There is no strength to be gained from hurting one another, only weakness. I don't care about hurting and not hurting. I don't care about other people, and nobody else does either. They pretend to. I don't want to pretend. I want to be free. <laughs> so, there's a lot here. My I, favorite the, character. The first thing we need to the first thing we need to focus on is my favorite line in the book. I read an article in a magazine about Adonianism. She's I, gonna she's gonna conclude on this entire social structure. I, I mean, I think I think see, I think she is. I think she's a great character and yes. I think like yes. she's this like scintillating brilliant person who who has like morphed herself into the role of like you know subservient female because that's what the society demands of her um and that that's yeah, it, it, like god th there's so much to say about just this character and how this uh, yeah. is yet another way of talking about the themes of the story because mm -hmm. um the sexes are highly unequal in the society yeah and and you can almost say like a, a, a male um um, uh, Urusian Ur and a female Urusian are are like in different worlds, basically, right? And and they're both operating under very different um, uh, rules and and um, incentives. Um, and I don't know. She just she I, I love her. But anyway, the point I was gonna what I was gonna say is I I'm pretty sure she's joking here. Right. Like she's sure she's like, how do you know? And, and she's like, I read it and I read it about it in a magazine. Right. Like she's hamming up the like, I'm just a girl. What do I know? Like right, that's her. Right. That's the that's the put on. Right. Yeah. Um, I, I had originally I, I pulled it. I had originally pulled the thing where she explains how mm -hmm. even though there is clearly this this great inequality and imbalance in the sexes that that she's like, no, we control the men and we don't mind that, that we have no positions of leadership and we're I'm perfectly happy doing what I and like she just makes. Yeah, she's she's absolutely slotting into the role that society wants her to, to be. And and yeah, I mean, I think I think that that <laughs> the magazine article thing is certainly part of that. Um, yeah, it's a great I, I wish I could have included it, Jake, but I had to make some I had to make some hard cuts uh, on some of the stuff. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, I, I, I love what people are talking about, it, positive freedom versus negative freedom, because I absolutely think that that's exactly what these sides look at. Like she looks at um, this, the expectation of communal assistance as an inhibition on her freedom, whereas he looks at laws and someone specifically writing down externally what I can and can't do as a, uh, as as prison, and that's 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 the thing that their argument here is basically: where is it better for those pressures to lie externally? She says because then you can rebel against it if you don't like it anymore, or internally in your head. Where whereas he says no, like the limitations limitations should be self imposed, right? Is what he's saying. I should I should set my own limitations. Um, mm -hmm. And and they they disagree about this, and I, I don't know if the book is like definitive about which of these two things is clearly empirically better. I don't know. No, I don't know. I, I, again, once again, my take after finishing the book and thinking about it was um, whether you have your conscience living in a in a temple or living in your head, you are a slave to it. <laughs> sure, sure. Either way, um, and may, maybe neither is better than the other. 
maybe they're just two different ways of being. And I mean, for me personally, um, <clears throat> like, like the idea of having internalized the mob's sense of right and wrong is terrifying and, 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 uh, gross, um, and like just intrinsically. Um, but I can totally, like, I can totally imagine, you know, a person very similar to me, except, except they're just like equally offended by the idea that, you know, people, people, you know, the, the law will, would, would tell them what to do. Yeah. Um, like I, I can see either of these things and I'm just like, yeah, like, I don't, I don't think you get out of that. I think it's just, a, it's just a, a, a dilemma. You take one horn or the, or the other or both somehow. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, it, it is certainly there. I think there are definitely people out there that would look at this whole thing. And I think they exist on an RS is like, just knowing, just knowing I can do whatever I want is enough to make me feel free. I wouldn't do it. Like I'm going to conform to like to the societal expectation of me. I'm fine doing that, but it makes me feel free knowing I don't have to. Um, and I, I do think, I do think that's one of the things that the book is talking about for sure. Yeah, that's cool. So people in the chat are, are mentioning that this seems to be uh, a reference to a Russian scientist named Kropotkin, who who basically did some sort of um, Darwinian research uh, in the late 1800s, early 1900s into animals basically in, in Siberia. And, and it's kind of from him that a lot of this idea that like oh, interesting. In, in a social species, it's, it's the animal that sort of serves its, its kin and, and its, its unit the best that does the best uh, rather than just, you know, survival of the fittest. It's, it's basically kin. So it's what we call kin selection now. I don't know what they called it back then. Yeah. Um, um, but, uh, I mean, I, I, I think, I think our, I don't, I don't really trust the human species with anything <laughs> like Darwinian mode, but like, like as soon as you use the word Darwinian in, in context of how you're going to govern your, your society, you have opened the door to some of the worst things that we've ever done as a species. That's very true. Yes. So, so like, let's, let's uh, hold, hold, hold on now. Um, maybe, maybe not so much with the Darwinian philosophies, um, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah Another, they, uh... Before we move on from um, the this idea of external versus internal law, like I think the one area where I really had to suspend my disbelief was the idea that they just don't have like law enforcement on Anaris, and I was like, okay, like there's gonna be like, I'm sorry to go here, but like there's gonna be pedophiles and serial killers, and and monsters of all kinds of other stripe that I, I don't even want to mention. Um, and like, those are just like, we, we can't pretend that they're just not going to happen. So we just, for the sake of the book, we kind of have to pretend it's not going to happen because peer pressure isn't going to make people not do those things. Mm -hmm. see, see, and, and Jake says, that's when you round up a posse. That's the thing you, you can run, you round up a posse, um, but is a posse going to just lynch the first person they find who they don't like? Or is a posse going to put on a trial with the presumption of innocence um, and, uh, and, and convict the right person and punish the right person, right? Like, like, like it's, it's, it's just the, the, the person who's the criminal is just going to get away with it because there, any smart criminal is just going to frame someone else and then the mob is going to lynch that person, right? Like sure, it's, yeah, yeah. It's just... It's just it's just really obvious that this wouldn't actually work. I haven't given a lot of thought to this. I I, I do think I, I I would have been interesting to see the book explore that a little bit, and and I, I wonder what Le Guin would have thought about like how that would work. I mean, it, certainly like I, they 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 do kind of reference to the fact that if if some if someone starts doing things that are just beyond the pale bad, that that society as a whole would kind of rise up against them and and push them to the external or or remove them. Um, but yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I don't think it would be like a. I don't think it would be like a. Uh, like there would not be tons and tons of this happening, but I do think mm -hmm. it would happen. Yeah, I mean, John. John kind of points out like mo most crime is caused is caused by property. And yeah. So you you get rid of a lot of crime, just but but still, there's. I mean, there's. Yeah, I, I think you you just have to be like, okay, the book. Sorry, book. We're gonna have to pretend that there's no such thing as heinous violent crime, um, which yeah. there's going to be. Yeah. But we'll just set that aside. Yeah, I I, I definitely think like the crime crime is mostly caused by by poverty right generally so yeah like the, no property no money no no needs being met 
um if you're if your basic needs are being met there's no reason to do crime but yeah i mean there are exceptions to everything so yeah, yeah a serial killer would pop up uh, um yeah to make to make a criminal create a law exactly yeah um yes the idea is that such selfish impulses would be sheltered um yeah but not be sheltered yeah 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 i i, I absolutely i think i think the society would but i i do agree with you matt that that like a, a clever like monster could could use that to his advantage i i yeah i don't know yeah i'm just gonna write a horrifying and upsetting fanfic about a serial killer on why would you an RS? why would you do that i i, I bet actually. like i i would actually bet money that that exists <laughs> probably yeah everything <laughs> exists right yes yeah no I, I have no actual desire to do that by the way that <laughs> sounds it sounds miserable <laughs> <laughs> oh, everyone in the chat is saying that sounds like a great idea. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, it would be an interesting right. thought experiment to kind of see what what an, an anarchistic society would, how they would react to that. Um, yeah, yeah. And in what ways, yeah. All right. Um, next slide. Uh, so Shevik explains sequentialism and simultaneism, the quest for definitive answers. But it's true, chronos chronosophy does involve ethics, because our sense of time involves our ability to separate cause and effect, means and end. The baby, again, the animal, they don't, they don't see the difference between what they do now and what will happen because of it. They can't make a pulley or a promise. We can. Seeing the difference between now and not now, we can make the connection. And there, morality enters in, responsibility. To say that a good end will follow from a bad, a bad means, it's just like saying that if I pull a rope on this pulley, it will lift the weight on that one. I break a promise. Sorry, God, I'm having so much trouble reading. To break a promise is to deny the reality of the past. Therefore, is it is to deny the hope of a real future. If time and reason are functions of each other, we if we are creatures of time, then we had better know it and try to make the best of it, to act responsibly. But look here, said Diari, with ineffable satisfaction in his own keenness, you just said that in your simultaneity system, there is no past and future, only a sort of eternal present. So how can you be responsible for the book that's already written? All you can do is read it. There's no choice, no freedom of action left. That is the dilemma of determinism. You are quite right. It is implicit in simultaneous thinking. But sequency thinking also has its dilemma. It is like this. To make a foolish little picture, you are throwing a rock at a tree. And if you are simultaneous, the rock has already hit the tree. But if you are a sequentist, it never can. So which do you choose? Maybe you prefer to throw rocks without thinking about it. No choice. I prefer to make a thing to make things difficult and choose both. How how do you reconcile them? The shy man asked earnestly. Chevik laughed nearly in despair. I don't know. I've been working a long time on it. After all, the rock does hit the tree. Neither pure sequency nor pure unity will explain it. We don't want purity, but complexity. The relationship of cause and effect, means and end. Our model of the cosmos must be an inexhaustible must be as inexhaustible as the cosmos, a complexity that includes not only duration but creation, not only being but becoming, not not only geometry but ethics. It is not the answer we are after, but only how to ask the question. All very well, but what industry needs is answers," said Dean. Shevik turned slowly, looked down at him, and said nothing at all. <laughs> uh. That's great. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I love I love the physics uh, mumbo jumbo parts a lot. Yeah, actually. yeah. I mean, the the talk about linearity versus circular and and how these two things seem to d directly oppose each other and yet um, seem to be true as well. Um, and and I love like he goes on this like the the thing the thing is that Shevik was on his planet and he felt like he wasn't getting anywhere because none of the people that were around him um, were thinking the way he was thinking and were on the same wavelength that he was on. And he was frustrated by it. And part of the reason he wanted to go to Anaris is to find the kind of thinkers that would understand what he's trying to do and he be able to talk with them. And so he goes on this long, long thing about how there are these two things and they both seem true, but they also both seem directly in, in contradiction of each other, and I'm not sure how to deal with that. 
and I, I, it's going to be complicated. It's going to be a, a, a the the model is as vast as the cosmos itself. There's no easy answers to these questions, but I have to keep asking the questions. And the response is, okay, but we seriously, dude, we need some answers. <laughs> and he's <Yeah>. just like, <sighs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, and 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 they're they're being more. They're also being more transparent about the fact that like we're we're sort of tolerating you because we think you might lead to right. giving us this faster than light travel right which is uh, which, all they all they want is the result all, like what industry needs is answers they want the result of his thing and he's just asking the questions <laughs> yeah which is of course you know how he gets there in the end yeah um miss evil doom points out what i was just gonna say which is i love um you know the 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 ancient the ancient uh, earth physicist with some very queer ideas uh i <laughs> I, I, Einstein, um, <laughs> who, who is, of course, Einstein. Yeah, um, I, I'm not going to lie. I was reading that, and I was like, this sounds a lot like Einstein. And then I looked at the name, and I was like, oh. <laughs> yeah. I, I got it. I got yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah, I think, that's, I think that's absolutely right, John. And I think that the mistake to make from this book would be to walk away from it thinking it, it, is, it is clear about an answer right it is that like like here's the definitive answer the book is saying this is what's right this is what's wrong i i, I don't think it is i think i think part of part of what what um Shevik realizes that is that is the way in which these two forces that he's dealing with uh also pair with these two societies and mm-hmm. and how and that they they both exist and they, they seemed it, it seems impossible for them to intermingle in the way he thought you know like i remember earlier in the book he talked about you know like i'm gonna bring the walls down um i'm gonna bring our exiled people home and there's gonna be this beautiful exchange of information and integration and we're gonna teach you our ways and and you're gonna see how obviously correct and better this 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 way of thinking and and behaving and organizing is and at this point he's just kind of like no, <laughs> I mean that's the end when he says, "Like I can't bring my stuff to that to these people. They have to. They have to come to us." Um, it's mm-hmm. such a such an important realization for him. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean the the idea that there's this dilemma between simultaneous and and sequency thinking is, mm-hmm. is the same as the dilemma between, you know, uh, statist capitalist and anarcho communist. Where yeah. it's like, it's like, are they? Are they really two different things, or are they two sides of the same coin? And and unifying them becomes kind of his his project, or or you know realizing their unity. Rather, because yeah. he doesn't do anything, he just realizes that they were already the same thing. Yeah. And in 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 a certain you know a certain point of view, they are. Yeah, yeah. I think you're right, David. He says they they liquored him up and put those guys there to prompt Shevik. I think mm-hmm. that is absolutely what's going on here with Vea herself and then all the people around. This was a this was a coordinated attempt to get him wasted and see and see if he can if he can dish on how his research is going. Um, yep. Yep. And I, I love agree. that that's like it's in there, right? That's certainly in the book, but the book doesn't harp on that. Like it's it's like there's so much going on in the background of this book that our character is is barely aware of or aware of, but just isn't focusing on. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it's just very well constructed. I feel like if they made this a movie, they would really amp up the like thriller aspect yeah, where there's probably. like these guys are really really putting pressure on him and breaking into his office and trying to steal his papers and all that. Because yeah. that stuff happens. It's just so it's it's relatively inconsequential to the plot, and Shevik just kind of doesn't really care that much. Yeah. So. Yeah, I mean, I, I did not pull a slide on on the the uh, rape of of Vea, um, but that was an extremely disturbing thing that just kind of fell out of nowhere, right? Um, mm-hmm. I, I was like, oh, we're oh Jesus, Jesus, um, and I, I don't know, like I don't want to spend too much time on this. It's a very uncomfortable, you know, hurtful topic. But what was your, I guess, what was your take on on? Was it just he got really wasted and got confused? Um, is this supposed to reflect on his society? I don't think so. Um, I didn't have much of a deep reading on it, honestly. I kind of felt like um, he was super drunk, had no experience with alcohol. And like like you could even have a reading where uh, they wanted to like get him in a compromising position so they could blackmail him or something. Like I... I, I really don't know what the story was trying to do with that. Like, like why was that in there? 
Um, I, I I don't know what it says about his culture or their cult. Like, I, I, yeah, I don't know what to do with it. Um, yeah. Did you? I, I, I'm just kind of uh, fumbling here. Do you have a you have a read on it? Not really. I mean, I, there there is the point where like he he's talking with her very earlier on in their conversation before the party even starts. He's talking with her and she like sits down and he's like, "Whoa, she's being like super super sexual." Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Uh, so like I, I don't know if it's just like he's totally misreading the situation um and just and just like making assumptions in which there are none um but it is very like like he 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 takes her in a very kind of proprietarian kind of way mm-hmm. right um and it's just ve- it's very very disturbing um yeah, yeah. And, and as as daniel's pointing out society has no consequences for him on this he feels bad about it certainly um Yes, but but th- in this society, nothing is done, and, and she, yeah, her reaction to it is just like, oh, look what you've done. Um, it's it's uh, again, I think, reflecting very badly on the Eurasian society. Yeah, because she, I mean, as as hurt and uh, offended as she might be, she kind of has no recourse to do anything about it. Which, yeah. despite her sort of telling this story about how, like, well, my society has laws. It's mm-hmm. like, well, the laws don't matter if no one enforces the laws. I think that was that was one thing that I did take away from it is like, yeah. Okay, well, a crime happens to the woman who was talking about how her society has laws, and then you see the hypocrisy or the the emptiness, rather, yeah. of that. Um, yeah, yeah, and I mean, I think there was, I think maybe there is something to be said about kind of the the uh, failure of of um, I, just to riff on what five six seven is basically saying. Like, like I think that she, like she's she's flirting with him, but he takes that as like. Oh, she wishes to have sex with me now. Yeah, because yeah. That's that's kind of how their society. Time works. to copulate. Yeah, yes, they're, they're yes. much more free in that. Yeah, I mean, I, I do I do like the idea that she is this woman who who loudly proclaims that actually we are the ones in control, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and then has that that taken from her in this horrific way um, mm-hmm. to kind of show that that's that's just an illusion. Um, yeah, for her. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's. I feel like we we went somewhere with it, mm-hmm, but yeah, mm-hmm. it's it's definitely a big a big ugly uncomfortable thing in there. Yeah, um, I mean, I agree with I agree like to just the last point. I agree with Daniel that he he feels bad about it, but not like, not like, he, he doesn't he loses like a night of sleep over it and then just kind of moves on. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, it, it it. I mean, maybe we could like. I, I feel like maybe his whole society just doesn't have, um, I don't know that they, they, they don't consider this to be bad perhaps a, like, a, as comparably bad. I don't know because I mean, they, they mention rape is a thing that happens on occasion on, on, uh, the moon. So, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, I don't yeah, know. But maybe they, I mean, honestly, maybe they don't consider things that, we would consider rape to be rape because that's fair. That's fair. Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't know. know. I don't know. I don't know. All yeah, right. We're, 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 Let's move we're on. Cause this is, yeah, yeah. I, feel, I feel, I feel, I feel awkward about this. Yes, um, yes. It's a very sensitive topic and I, I don't have a lot of experience in how to yeah. talk about this stuff. So, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think you're right. He thinks she wants him and doesn't understand why the timing is not right. And he's unquestionably wrong about that, but yeah, perhaps that's why he's not feeling as, as, as guilty as he probably should. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, yeah, I, I actually, it makes sense that the guilt that he feels is not the violation of her, but more the violation of his principles of like, he, he tried to own her in a way. And, and, and that's where he forces the guilt. Um, There's that. And also like, I, I'm not sure if he's like actually broken with being monogamous, like, like, has he decided like I'm never going back home so I don't need to be you know monogamous anymore or did that just kind of happen and then he would feel ashamed about that I don't think that? he was thinking yeah uh, yeah I don't I don't think that even occurred to him in the scene so yeah. yeah All right um let's talk about refusing some postings and and okay. the nightmare moment of this book for me <laughs> Why didn't he refuse the posting then Listen Takvar I thought the same thing exactly we always say that you said it sh- you shouldn't have refused to go to Rolney. I said it as soon as I got to Elbow. I'm a free man. I didn't have to come here. We always think that and say it, but we don't do it. 
we keep our initiative tucked away safe in our mind, like like a room where we can come and say, I don't have to do anything. I make my own choices. I'm free. Then we leave the little room in our mind and go where PDC posts us and stay till we're reposted. Oh, Chev, that's not true. Only since the drought. Before that, there wasn't half so much posting. People just worked up jobs where they wanted them and joined a syndicate or formed one, and then registered with DivLab. DivLab mostly posted people who preferred to be in, gen in general labor pool. It's going to go back to that again now. I don't know. It ought to, of course, but even before the famine, it wasn't going in that direction, but away from it. Badap was right. Every emergency, every labor draft even, tends to leave behind an, it, behind it an increment of bureaucratic machinery within PDC. And it's a kind of rigidity. This is the way it was done. This is the way it is done. This is the way it has to be done. There was a lot of that before the drought. Five years of stringent control may have fixed the pattern permanently. Don't look so skeptical. Listen, you tell me. How many people do you know who refused to accept a posting, even before the famine? What are you getting at? Takfar grumbled, retiring further under the blanket. Well, this. That we're ashamed to say we refused a posting. That the social conscience completely dominates the individual conscience instead of striking a balance with it. We don't cooperate. We obey. We fear being outcast, being called lazy, dysfunctional, egoizing. We fear our neighbor's opinion more than we respect our own freedom of choice. You don't believe me, Tack, but try. Just try stepping over the line, just in imagination, and see how you feel. You'll realize, then, what Tyran is, and why he's a wreck, a lost soul. He is a criminal. We have created crime, just as the propertarians did. We force a man outside the sphere of our approval and then condemn him for it. We've made laws, laws of conventional behavior, built walls all around ourselves, and we can't see them, because they're a part of our thinking. Tyr never did that. I knew him since we were ten years old. He never did it. He never could build walls. He was a natural rebel. He was a natural Adonian. A real one. He was a free man. And the rest of us, his brothers, drove him insane in punishment for his first free act. So that's some powerful shit. Yeah. Right there. I mean, like, like you said, this was like as, as, as uncomfortable as I already was the, the, the part of the story where it's, it's basically played as a reveal that like he's, he's, he's almost talking to himself as if he's going to ignore the posting. And then it's just like four years later. Yeah. And yeah. he has not seen his child in several years. Yeah. And, and I, yeah. I mean, you as a father and me as uh, soon to be father, I think that, I think that hit home, especially for us. Like, like I, the idea that, a society like just just that general idea that i would i would feel this enormous pressure to uh not be in my child's life is is yeah. so inherently disturbing to me and look I, I obviously as someone said before that like even even in a an anar in an anarchist society right like social pressure exists right we we internalize social pressures we internalize feelings of of guilt of expectation we we all do this i think every human being does this right but this society has elevated it to a point where it can make someone choose not to be with their child um yeah. and that's that terrifies me yeah I, I think it's like well when, when that's the only tool you have when you don't have the threat of you know of, of a police officer arresting you for not doing what you're supposed to do when all you have is social pressure and it's and it's a necessity to keep the machine running then it by necessity becomes this overwhelmingly powerful thing that you just can't refuse. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. I mean, it's, it's like, like I already, I mean, God, I don't know I, it, what Jesse says here in the chat. Um, he, he says that it, it seems unrealistic when this happens to the mothers in the story. Um, and I, I like, I think, I mean, I guess I, I understand the feeling like the story itself shows the part where his mother is basically in, in, like like s s trapped in this like eternity of grief because because basically she was deprived of her child and Shevik now hates her. Right. Mm -hmm. Basically, Shevik hates her for doing exactly what he does here, more or less. Right. Yeah. Where, where, where like she she was posted elsewhere. She had to go elsewhere. Um, I mean, am, are, are you reading that the same as me, though? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think, I think she's worse than Shevik in that, like, I don't, I, I, it, it's more extended and she, I, I, yeah, I mean, I, I think you're right. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, there's, there's, there's a lot of interesting 
points in in the chat about um how like for a period of time we were all told that holding babies is is bad and and it is bad for them and so the babies were held less and it's like yeah it's like yeah like, like actually social pressure um especially around children god social pressure around children can make people do ridiculous things um because you don't know what the hell you're doing you're desperate for for any guidance mm-hmm. and if people tell you you know uh you know wrap your child in a in a swaddle and don't let them touch the ground for the first four years of their life then you'll be like okay okay you say so. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, I mean, there's there's all kinds of forces here. And and I think the mistake, and and I, I'm not s- saying you're doing this 5, 6, 7, and I, and, and I totally agree with you. I think the mistake is to, is to make this an either or, right? To say that, like, well, clearly, since this disturbs me, then, my, then the way that I live under is better. And, and I don't think that's what the story is saying. I don't think the story is trying to pit these two systems against each other and declare which one is worse and which one is better. I think they all have their issues. I think the, the important part is this was constructed as, as a supposed, uh, an ambiguous utopia. Like this is supposed to be a, a utopic society and it still has those same kind of uh, pressures and, and that, that disturbed me just as much. And, and I love the book for it. I love that we did this. It's so fascinating to me that like like any other story i think takes a utopia and just says okay this is why this is awesome (laughs) and and it's like here's why it's awesome but here's why it's not yeah Uh, i mean just to 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 run with that like she could have written it in such a way where where it was like oh yes and and then of course when you have a a family um you're you're allowed to stay with your children until Mm -hmm. they turn uh, 16 and then they're sent off to the uh education and it's like it's like well no like like no society just does everything right <laughs> um because because the point like like societies are are organisms the book yeah. the book talks about this the book mm-hmm. called, uh, talks about the idea that um that it's that it's that a human society is an organism it's you know the 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 organism of of i forget the term they use but basically that's it yeah um and it's like it 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 it, it will have it will have terrible problems Mm-hmm. Uh, any society, any group of people, mm-hmm. yeah, <laughs> um, it's it's unavoidable. Like, yeah, and and that doesn't mean that doesn't mean that you don't strive to improve your society. Like you know, like it, it's it it's very easy to fall into the trap of like, well, because this utopia will have its problems. What is even the point, right? And I think that's part of what what Shevik's earlier thing about um about um um God like uh, suffering and. Mm-hmm. Uh, is that like we can't fix suffering <laughs> and so yeah. it's like well yeah but that doesn't mean like obviously suffering is part of the human condition we're all yeah. going to suffer that is one that is one universal that there are things that are going to make us suffer in our lives and that doesn't mean you don't continuously try to improve your society and, and work towards a society that's better but also recognizing that there's not going to be like in there's like like with the the um model of the cosmos there's no simple solution there's no simple answer there's no okay we're going to have this revolution and we're going to switch this system and that's gonna we're we're good we're yeah. good now yeah I, I like that a lot i remember being much younger and being like really really surprised and shocked when i came across somebody using the term utopianist as a, a derogatory term uh, i was like what, what why are you criticizing someone for being a utopianist it, it, <laughs> it, like it shouldn't everyone have a shouldn't everyone want to to have a, perf, a perfected world mm-hmm. and and the idea is like you should want to have a better world but if you really think that your ideas are going to lead to a perfected world you're probably dangerously delusional and um just like like uh settle for doing better yeah <laughs> don't, don't reach yeah. for utopia yeah. uh um, it's it's very easy as this book shows in, in both societies and we're, we're going to get to what happened on Terra uh, soon, but it, it's very easy to sit back and just be like, well, th- this is all we can do. Um, mm-hmm. There's no reason to do any better. And yeah. 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 Good. Good point, Jake. Don't let the perfect be the enemy of good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, circling back to parents. I, I just want to point out, Sophie says that like, in the past, my grandfather had virtually nothing to do with my dad until he was about 15. They lived together, but they barely meaningfully interacted. So the idea that parents are inherently drawn to a particular mode of experienced parenthood is one that I'm not sure about. Yeah. I mean, I wonder, like, I don't want to make assumptions about a person I don't know, but I wonder, like, do you think there's internal conflict about that? Like, do you think that there is the, the inherent 
parental drive conflicting with societal expectations yeah. of of what the what the male role was um i i don't know i, I wonder i wonder if they're like because my, my dad is i love my father so very much but he is very much the the prototypical like boomer man um mm-hmm. he's very reserved he, he was a great dad um he was around a, a lot and and i had a really good interaction with him but he doesn't express himself very much he doesn't talk about the ways he's feeling um and yeah i i I don't i don't know i don't know um i don't know how much of that is how much of that is the the biological pressures pushing against societal pressures yeah yeah i mean i feel like in in the united states we've been through this weird thing that was like a weird artifact of cultural change and world war ii and and shit like that where it's like you know, our our great grandfathers beat our grandfathers with sticks. Our grandfathers spanked our fathers with belts, but less frequently. Our fathers stopped hitting us, <laughs> and now we tell our children how we feel all the time. Yeah. <laughs> this, is, yeah. this is weird. I mean, it's definitely not like it's not like we're part of some steady state process. Our, our culture is in like free fall, and I have no idea where it's going, honestly. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't draw too many. I, I, the point is, I wouldn't draw too many conclusions from any particular person. Partially because I think part of the point of the book is that different people will want different things. Like Shevik yeah, himself, yeah, we're speaking sort of in cast, very broad generalities, yeah. right? Yeah, like like Shevik is unusually um, drawn toward this idea of monogamy, right? Yeah, and and most of the people in the world are not. And I mean, maybe that ref- like maybe that's realistic. I don't know. Like I I I feel a strong pull to monogamy. I know, I know I have a lot of personal friends who definitely don't. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I think like the, one of the issues with, you know, when you make your society like this is it, is it tries to fit everyone in the same mold. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Well said. All right. Uh, next slide. God, it's been like 20 minutes since we were on that side. I know. Uh, <laughs> this is, this is, this is bad, but good. Uh, so here's Shevik <laughs> chats with an earthling. We are both aliens here, Shevik, she said at last. I from much further away in space and time. Yet I begin to think that I am much less alien to Urus than you are. Let me tell you how this would seem, how this world seems to me. To me and to all my fellow Terrans who have seen the, the planet, Urus is the kindliest, most various, most beautiful of all the inhabited worlds. It is the world that comes as close as any could to paradise. She looked at him calmly and keenly. He said nothing. I know it's full of evils, full of human injustice, greed, folly, waste, but it is also full of good, of beauty, vitality, achievement. It is what a world should be. It is alive, tremendously alive, alive, despite all its evils, with hope. Is that not true? He nodded. Now, you, a man from a world I cannot even imagine, you who see my paradise as hell, will you ask what my world must be like? He was silent, watching her. His light eyes steady. My world, my earth, is a ruin. A planet spoiled by the human species. We multiplied and gobbled and fought until there was nothing left, and then we died. We controlled neither appetite nor violence. We did not adapt. We destroyed ourselves. But we destroyed the world first. There are no forests left on my earth. The air is gray. The sky is gray. It is always hot. It is habitable. It is still habitable. But not as this world is. This is a living world, a harmony. Mine is a discord. You Odonians chose a desert. We Terrans made a desert. We survive there as you do. People are tough. There are nearly a half billion of us now. Once there were nine billion. You can see the old cities still everywhere. The bones and bricks go to dust, and the little pieces of plastic never do. They never adapt either. We failed as a species, as a social species. We are here now dealing as equals with other human societies on other worlds only because of the charity of the Hainish. They came, they brought us help, they built ships and gave them to us so we could leave our ruined world. They treat us gently, charitably, as the strong man treats the sick one. They are a very strange people, the Hainish, older than any of us, infinitely generous. They are altruists. They are moved by a guilt we don't even understand, despite all our crimes. They are moved in all they do, I think, by their their past, their endless past. Well, we have saved what could be saved and made a kind of life in the ruins on Terra. 
in the only way we c- it could be done by total centralization total control over the use of every acre of land every scrap of metal every ounce of fuel total rationing birth control euthanasia universal conscription into the labor force the absolute regimentation of each life toward the goal of racial survival we had achieved that much when the hanish came they brought us a little more hope not very much we have outlived it we can only look at this splendid world this vital society this earth this paradise from the outside we are capable only of admiring it and maybe envying it a little not very much i love this part of the book um <laughs> yeah. i love it a lot yeah i just love that like you who see my paradise as hell will you ask me what my world must be like mm-hmm. yeah i mean again it, it goes to d- a differing perspectives and, and different points of view and, and how we look at things and and i i think the key here the the mistake would be to look at this and and say okay well because earth is clearly much worse off than urus then urus is perfect right and because anaris is clearly much much better than urus then it's perfect right that, that that's the mistake to make is, is look to play this comparison game and then say well then, we don't. We did it. <laughs> this is the ultimate, um, and, and I think that is one thing that the book is pushing against. It is it is acknowledging that there are these different systems and these different conditions that breed different forms of organization, of civilization, of society, and they all are fucked up in their own specific ways. And we can talk about which are more fucked up than others, but that doesn't mean we should like just say yay at least we're not earth hooray yeah i like how you know she asks you know she 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 says to him like yeah i get i get all the the evil that you see in this world but don't you also see all the hope all the potential and and he nods yeah he says yeah yeah yeah." so so basically you're saying like well you can even see hope in what you consider to be a hell and i can even see the flaws in what i consider to be a paradise Mm -hmm. and i think i think that's just where we have to sit we have to we have to understand that um you know, yeah, it would, it would sure be nice if we had a whole bunch of natural resources on Earth. Um, sure, you know, but I, I do think I do think Le Guin subscribes to this to to a more um, communalistic, communistic like type of system. Like I, I can kind of tell through her writing that like that is the one she more closely identifies with. Right? I mean, even in this 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 passage, like why? How did how did the Earthlings get more hope? Um, through through the, the 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 generosity of this other organization that came and shared and mm-hmm. said here here's this I'm going to give you this and and as part of this I'm going to give you hope so I do think like I, I think Le Guin believes in this stuff and, and I think it it says a lot of her as a person that despite believing in these things she isn't afraid to also poke at them and say here are the problems that can arise from them um, yes. Yes. I mean, I think I think the book is a study of extremes, right? Each, mm-hmm. each of these worlds is an extreme. I mean, yeah. the, the, the Urus is not um, I mean, Urus feels like a very pointed criticism of, of America, um, but it's also a hyper exaggerated science fiction you know, genre <laughs> tropified sure, sure, version. Yeah. Right. It, it's 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 hyper stylized. And, and that's that's the thing. Everything everything is hyper stylized. And, and I think. Um, I mean, I, I don't, I don't think the answer is like, oh, the answer is in the middle, but I think the answer is definitely not at the extremes Mm -hmm. because the extremes are, um, well, in in every case, somebody gets hurt, right? Some, somebody gets hurt on, on earth, Urus and Anaris, right? They're just different people in each case. Sure. Yeah. Um, uh, in chat, they're talking about. (laughs) <laughs> They're talking about the fact that the, we this kind of makes it very clear that this is, book is part of the the Hainish cycle, which is the mm. the left hand of darkness. The other Le Guin book we read is part of. I mean, this is like the creation of the Ansible, which is a thing that was referenced in that book as well, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. John is saying two hundred two thousand years before the left side of darkness is when this book took place, and cool. that Earth in that book has recovered. So that's great. Good, good for you, Earth. Good, good for those guys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's that's fun. Yeah, um, yeah. I, wasn't the wasn't I uh, ha- actually Hainish? Uh, oh gosh, Gin- Ginley I. I'm pretty sure he was. I think so. I, oh, it's... actually, no. I think he was. No, he was from Earth. Earth. Yeah, yeah, he was an Earthling. Yeah. But but yeah. it was like a Hainish 
mission that he yes. was on. Yes. 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 Yes, yes, that is correct. We got there. We got there eventually. Yeah, I, I remembered he was from Earth because of the uh, the line about uh, uh, the child of an arsonist recognizing the smell of fire. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's uh, hilarious what things stick with you, huh? Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, cool. All right. Um, let's talk about their, their, their meeting here. We, we go back to them. This is back in the past where Shevik is arguing about sending an arrestee to Urus. Well, there's the question, Shevik said, of sending an arrestee to Urus. There were exclamations and queries. Shevik did not raise his voice, which was not far above a bumble, but persisted. It wouldn't harm or threaten anyone living on Anaris, and it appears that it's a matter of the individual's right, a kind of test of it, in fact. The terms of the settlement don't forbid it. To forbid it now would be an assumption of authority by the PDC, an abridgment of the right of the Adonian individual to initiate action harmless to others. Rulag sat forward. She was smiling a little. Anyone can leave Anaris, she said. Her light eyes glanced from Shevik to Badap and back. He can go wherever he likes, if, a, if the proprietarian freighters will take him. He can't come back. Who says he can't? Badap demanded. The terms of the closure of the settlement. Nobody will be allowed off the freight ships farther than the boundary of the port of Anaris. Well, now, that surely wasn't meant to apply to Arasti, not Anaresti, said an old advisor, Ferdaz, who liked to stick his oar in even when it steered the boat off the course he wanted. A person coming from Uras is Arasti, said Rulag. Legalisms, legalisms, what's all this quibbling, said a calm, heavy woman named Treppel. Quibbling, cried the new member, the young man. He had a North Rising accent and a deep, strong voice. If you don't like quibbling, try this. If there are people here that don't like Anaris... Let him go. I'll help. I'll carry him to the port. I'll even kick him there. But if they try to come sneaking back, there's going to be some of us there to meet them. Some real Odonians. And they won't find us smiling and saying, Welcome home, brothers. They'll find their teeth knocked down their throats and their balls kicked up into their bellies. Do you understand that? Is that clear enough for you? Clear? No. Plain? Yes. Plain as a fart, said Bidep. Clarity is a function of thought. You should learn some Adonianism before you speak here. You're not worthy to say the name of Odo, the young man shouted. You're traitors, you and the whole syndicate. There are people all over Anaris watching you. You think we don't know what Shevik's been asked to go to Eurus to go sell Anaresti science to the profiteers? You think we don't know that all you snivelers would love to go there and live rich and let the proprietarians pat you on the back? You can go. Good riddance. But if you try coming back here, you'll meet with justice. Oh, I hate this guy. <laughs> I hate this guy too, but didn't this, this seem reminded me so much like a parliamentarian meeting or like Congress? <laughs> like it just totally. like the arguing here. It's just like uh, legalisms. Legalisms is such mm -hmm. a, a wonderful line here because yeah, they're arguing about law, right? And mm -hmm. and as five six seven is is saying, they're the terms of the closure of the settlement. So so the law, you know, like that's mm -hmm. that's the law. Um, and it's yeah. it's just a funny the push and pull here. Yeah, and, and then, you know, it boils down to basically mob justice, right? Which is, I, I mean, if anything, I, I was glad to see this in the story because it was like, okay, so Le Guin recognizes that the mob is capable of being stupid yeah. and, and wrong and, and violent in, in their, uh, uh, you know, enforcement of their stupid wrong beliefs. <laughs> um, and and like that's, like that's totally a thing that would happen and mm -hmm. does happen all the time. So there, there's no exemption just because you're, on a magical anarchist planet, you, you you would have mobs doing mob things for stupid reasons. Yeah, I mean, um, we see it at the very beginning of the book, and this is just this brings context to it, right? We see at the beginning of the book that he is uh, like almost stoned to death right. uh, as he's trying to make his way to the ship. Yeah, a man is actually killed by a a, a rock standing right next to him, and he's not even aware of it. I, oh yeah, yeah, I forgot about that. Touch. Yeah, yeah. Um, all because he just wants to do what he wants yeah and he just wants to share it too right he doesn't mm -hmm. want to sell it he just he wants to be an adonian and show them the way no he's come to bargain he's like, yeah he's not selling in the pure in the the proprietarian sense of selling yes but i don't even know that he ends up really bargaining anything I, it, like 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 what does he get out of them i don't No, i mean i think the the end like his conclusion is i think this is really important because this is like the conclusion of the novel is he realizes he can't bargain with these people yes, and yes. the ch the only choice is to just share it with everyone mm -hmm. with, with all societies, with all uh, it's that's, that's the right thing to do yeah. because you can't, you can't bargain 
for a revolution in this regard. Like you yeah. can't you can't convince people of an ideology through bargaining. Right. I think and is it, what it, he realizes. And it's the Odonian thing to do also. Yes. So yes. It demonstrates its own rightness. Yeah, and his and his commitment to to that belief system. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. Uh, which brings right. us to the Last, end. The lastest At last. slide. The closing words of the book. You're not, yeah, sorry. You're sure you want to walk through this wall with me, Ketho? You, you know, for me, it's easy. Whatever happens, I am coming home. But you are leaving home. True journey is return. I hope to return, Ketho said in his quiet voice, in time. When are we to enter the landing craft? In about 20 minutes. I'm ready. I have nothing to pack. Shevik laughed, a clear laugh, unmixed happiness. The other man looked at him gravely, as if he was not sure what happiness was, and yet recognized or perhaps remembered it from afar. <laughs> he stood behind Shevik as if there was something he wanted to ask him, but he did not ask it. It will be early morning at a nearest port, he said, and took his leave to get his things and meet Shevik at the launch port. Alone, Shevik turned back to the observation port and saw the blinding curve of sunrise over the Tamay, just coming into sight. I will lie down, lie down to sleep on Anaris tonight, he thought. I will li- lie down beside Takver. I wish I'd brought the picture, the baby sheep, to give Pilun. He, he had not brought anything. His hands were empty, as they had always been. Ah, <sighs> And Le Guin sticks to the landing perfectly. Yeah, yeah. Perfect I mean, book, perfectly written. Everything's I- perfect. I saw Jake mention something a little bit earlier that we didn't go into a lot on the slides, but the the relationship between Takvar and and uh, Shevik is is beautiful. I, I love it. it. It's such like it's this 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 concept of this uh, like they it is this partnership. It is this true partnership in um, this permanent partnership in in a world that doesn't that those things don't often happen. Um, and it, that makes it stick out even more. And I just love their interactions. I love their uh, the ways they the, the way they fight and they disagree and they quibble and they love. I just I love it all. I love it all. Yeah, Takfar is a great character. I, I wish I wish I had pulled more slides on on her. I it's it's very like I was so excited because I was like, oh, it's like a three hundred fifty page book. That's gonna be so much easier to pull stuff on. And then I realized that. No, it's not because it's so it's dense. It's a very dense yeah. novel and a short number of pages. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm just surprised that one of their conversations didn't kind of come in organically because they have so many conversations. In fact, I think one of them did actually. No, it, did. it did. Yeah. It did. Yeah. I, I, I'm telling you, like two hours ago, I had. 37 slides and i just had to start i got to a point where i was like having making so much i was having so much trouble like as i was going through my list of pages deciding which ones to not do i just said okay i'm just going to do them all and then after i finish i'm going to go back through and and yank them Mm -hmm. um and and uh some of them some of them fell out I have to wonder if someone in your position didn't uh wasn't tempted to include the extremely stressful childbirth scene um possibly yeah. the most stressful scene of the entire book i didn't i didn't run i didn't want to do that you didn't want to do that that made oh, me well, very well, that made well, me scared yeah that was god i i'm <laughs> my my child my, my childbearing days are behind me and then that <laughs> and that stressed me the hell out man god that that uh like he can't find the midwife mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. oh god yeah and he, he yeah oh my gosh yeah, his his conversation with the train driver. I I wrote that one down too. I I, I love that as well, Jake. Um, this man who's just like totally content in his life. Loved it. Yeah. Um, I, I love the fact that he brings this person. Like the, the realization he had at the end of of this story is basically like I cannot bring my ideology to these people. It won't work that way. They need to come to me. And then the book ends with this this Terran that he was talking to d- making the decision that I want to come see this. I want to learn about it. I want to learn about this way of life. Um and the and just like the hope that was brought to them through the Hainish. That brings a little hope, right? Mhm. Yeah. Love the it. Hainish seem very interesting. Yeah. I I'm sure more of these books get into the details of of who they are. Like like she she leaves these 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 tantalizing little clues like like uh they they're a guilt that i we can't even begin to understand and i was mm-hmm. like what what, what is that <laughs> like what what does it mean yeah 
I, I think I, I think I may have Wikipedia what the deal was with the Hanish, but but oh, yeah, you I, cheater, I like, you fucking I like, cheater. I know. I mean, I, I, I do like how it's not really spelled out in the books. Mm-hmm. Twenty-five entries. Oh my god, Dear I didn't Lord. realize that. That's a lot. Dear Lord, <laughs> just do them all for the book clubs. Yeah. No sweat. For, no for sweat. For the next two years. Uh, Vale, I'm, I'm moving. I'm moving in uh, a couple weeks, so I'm, I've packed up all the movies. So. That's why it's just Slimer. I see Ariel back there. What? Is that Ariel? No. That's Slimer. No, the the cup. Never mind. No, that's uh, it's Captain America. Are you sure? And that's Iron Man. Are that's you sure, I, Scott? Yeah, I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Um. Jake, the dispossessed, the Folio Society dispossessed, and the Folio Society left hand of darkness are beautiful and i want them both so bad but i i can't buy folio society for myself i've decided that i could only receive them as gifts so if my parents are listening and would like to purchase (laughs) the dispossessed for me um let's move on to q a well yeah uh, yeah yeah sophie it's it my yeah my life is insane um what (laughs) <laughs> one thing I told my wife as soon as we found out we were pregnant was I'll, I'll get you a house before the baby comes. And mm-hmm. so, uh, yay, I did it. Yay. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's a lot of stuff happening. It's a lot, a lot, a lot of crazy stuff. So, um, any questions or anything like I call it Q and a, you don't really have to ask questions. Just like bring up stuff. Maybe, um, maybe we didn't touch on in the limited slides I had or something you wanted to talk about that, that we didn't, or just, just let's just talk. Let's just hang out yeah. for, cause this, this episode hasn't been long enough. Let's just hang out for a little bit. Yeah. Let's just hang out. Yeah. So, so let's see so far. I have to write my serial killer on an Yeah. You got to get on that story mm-hmm. for soak for, uh, for do the right thing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I honestly, I cannot remember what what was the sexy. I don't remember the sexy furniture stuff. What was the sexy furniture? I, I think I think it was like he spends a lot of time looking at like the bathroom fixtures and the furniture, um, and um, and how and how it's all like voluptuous and curved and beautiful and like it, as opposed to being utilitarian. <laughs> oh yeah, so maybe he just he reads that as sexy when it's just. I mean, maybe that that goes to explain like why he misreads the situation with Vea so so bad. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I I, uh, I do I do sort of wonder if this wasn't Le Guin just like you know looking at at furniture and being like, why is it all like curved and 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 well, like why why is it shaped like this? Why have we decided this is the way we're going to shape furniture and bathroom fixtures? Cause butts. Cause cause it looks everything it's, is cause butts. Mm-hmm vaguely suggestive of um of of human body parts but is, is why we design them that way obviously but i mean i mean what if alien what, what if real aliens like came down and we're like so what's the deal with all the all the furniture that's shaped like your your bodies would you be like i don't know it's not it's just furniture <laughs> what are you seeing be such a weird fucking question <laughs> write that short story too matt that's yeah. the first question the aliens ask it's like hey yeah. so um we're flying overhead and why yeah. does all your furniture look like butts? Yeah. We weren't going to come down, but we just had to ask. <laughs> the fuck? Um, so Jake asks about the, the riot police stuff. Yeah, that was that was rough. I mean, when the helicopter just kind of opens up on the crowd, it's like, yeah. holy shit. Yeah, the, the section where he kind of thinks through, like, it, where, where he's like, obviously, people would be more effective if if they had ownership of their, of their, uh, of their work. And then he realizes like, Oh, the reason you have to brutalize them is so that you can order them to open fire on a crowd and have them listen. Mm -hmm. But that was, that was just absolutely scathing and it was awful. Quite correct. Yeah. And like, uh, Shevik like runs into this random man who shot and like takes care of him until he dies. And Mm -hmm. it's awful. Yeah. Yeah. That whole section. Yeah. What'd you think of the character of Shevik's servant? Um, yeah, that was, I got, there's so many things I wish I had pulled. Um, he's great. He's great. He's great. I mean, like he's really our first and, and really only 
window well not only but one of our few windows into the the underclass of society right because they were they were very specifically trying to hide that from him um and gives him a window into how things quote unquote really are right Mm -hmm. yeah i i love kind of the way the character has like a, a a um a dual nature sort of where you know he he he, sp- he speaks and acts like a a proper servant but then mm-hmm. once his guard comes down he he completely changes his affect and he has all these terrible tragic tales yeah yeah gosh um i i think we missed a question why was the book structured that way we talked about that a little bit at the beginning i think just to to make the divide the wall to 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 part of this wall symbolism between the two worlds and between two times and the the way in which things move linearly, but also cyclically, I think it's part of that whole thing. Um, Mm -hmm. And, and also perspectives, you know, you have the perspective of a young man looking forward and the perspective of an older man who, who is in, in the process of completing his mission and then completes his mission. And um, there's a, there's a kind of, symmetry to the two perspectives right yeah yeah Um, yeah um wow that's awesome to hear jake i'm I'm glad i'm glad this book did that for you i think that's that's just a wonderful thing about really really good literature right mm -hmm. yeah um is there any character moment in the story that you found particularly unrealistic i think you kind of talked about yours already matt um yeah I'm, i'm good um let's see i don't know i don't unrealistic hmm i don't i i I, like my uh my suspension of belief like radar is is pretty shot where i just kind of roll with anything (laughs) so uh, it doesn't usually happen to me where i'm like i don't think that was very realistic Uh, i just kind of roll in with it so i can't think of something off the top of my head we begin at the center but also at the beginning of a journey and finish where we return to the center yeah that's perfect Mm -hmm. well said Mm -hmm. yeah Oh gosh. Um I guess that all depends on where I am in the hierarchy of Eurus, right? Like <laughs> give me a choice between an Aris and being like a rich dude on Eurus. Hell yeah. Um that's an easy choice, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. But I mean the the problem the problem with societies like that is the that you often have no control over which society you live on. I think the romantic in me um <laughs> says like there would be a part of uh, an Aris culture that like like the you know a sort of kind of back to basics like like survive by your own gumption type of living that appeals to the the uh i don't know the struggler side of me i don't know mm-hmm. yeah i don't know i uh i don't, I don't know how to answer that mm-hmm. uh, but J- jesse asks would you rather live on Omalas or Anaris, um, which, <laughs> which I don't, I don't think I want to explain that because Scott hasn't read the ones who walk away from Omalas, and I want him to read it unspoiled. What, what is that? It's huh? it's another story by Le Guin, but I don't want to just tell you what it is because it's okay because that would like defeat the purpose of there being a short story. I mean, I've now made it my mission in life to read every single thing Le Guin has ever yeah. written a- I mean, ever so like three pages or something but like yeah it, it it's people in the chat have said um at various times um that uh, uh Gwen has apparently said that anaris is where the people who walk away from omalas go interesting and i don't know what to do with that because i'm like well clearly that's not i mean she doesn't mean that literally obviously but 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 like i don't even i'm not even sure on what level she means that figuratively because um, like I get, yeah, okay. I, 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 I do, I do get it. It's the type of person who, who refuses to let any unjust, any, any amount of injustice, exi- injustice exist, um, at all, no matter what it costs them. And I guess that does sound like a, an Ari, an, an, an Arasti. Um, please note as I'm opening a notepad that you just all saw so I could write these <laughs> names of these books down. Okay, yeah, I, 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 I feel like we talked about one of these during the Left Hand of Darkness, and I said, yeah, I'm totally going to read that, and then I, I didn't. Um, so I'm writing these down, so I actually will this time. Yeah, I think you can literally just Google 
ones who walk away from OMLS. Here, I've, there's the PDF, second link on Google. One, two, three, four, four pages. It's four <laughs> pages. Um, yeah, Jake, absolutely make that podcast. That would be amazing. Uh, my sister bought me a, a full copy of um, like a big... Um, f- uh, why can't I think of words anymore? Because I've been saying all of them. I've said all the words in the past three hours, and I'm out of them. I'm an illustrated version of Wizard of Earthsea. Um, mm-hmm. And I've still only read the, the first one for Book Club in that. And I think that would be a cool thing to read to the kid in a few years. Yeah. And by few, I mean like seven, yeah. eight. Yeah. God, I'll be so old. Fuck. Yeah, it'll fly by, though. Sorry. Sorry to tell you. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a beautiful collection. Yeah. It's very thick. It's it's like it's not practical to like read like <laughs> just normally, but I think like doing like as bedtime story um would be good a good use of it. Very thick. Awesome. I think my voice is actually starting to give out so Yeah, I think uh it's, this up. it's been it's it's midnight. Oh, dear lord. Wow. Okay. Yeah, we're going to wrap this thing up, folks. <laughs> um that was a lot of fun though. And I hope we did justice to that story by just scratching the surface of it, um, because I feel like that's all we did. We could read that book again in a year and have a completely different conversation about different parts of that book, for sure. Um, so next month, we are going to be reading Warbreaker by Brandon Sanderson. We put a Sanderson book on the poll, and it won, which is what happens every single time. Um, but this is actually the closest it's ever been. This only one by one vote, so... Um, this was the book that I think after we finished um, uh, The Way of Kings, everyone said we need to read this book before we read the next book in that series. So we're doing it. Yes, we're doing it. <laughs> um, so more more Brando Sando. Um, we're, so I've tentatively put the book club on the 1st of January, which is New Year's at 930. I don't know. I think that'll work, right? Like New Year's Day isn't a thing. I mean, yeah. New Year's like- Eve. Like every every day now is the same. So. That's true. That's true. Yeah. yeah, who's going to a big party on New Year's Eve? It's not right. not me. Yeah. 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 So yeah, it'll be the the first of January at nine thirty p.m. Um, we couldn't do the week before that because that is uh, that's Christmas. So we're doing we're doing the first of January, which is fine. Um, so get Warbreaker. And read it, and we'll be back next week to talk or next month to talk about it. Probably going to be a very different conversation than this month. I think. I just I have not read the book, but just guessing, just guessing. Yeah, yeah, change of pace, kind of. I'll, I'll be less intimidated to talk about it, probably. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, yeah, looking forward to that one. Uh, all right, yeah. So, hey, where's the script that tells us what to do? There it is. <laughs> so, um. As we close here, I just want to thank everyone for tuning in live. I had an amazing time. Y'all had some incredible points that that challenged me and made me think about this book more and I think allowed me to wrap my head around what was a very complicated novel. So thank you, everyone, for attending live. For those that are listening to this after the fact on the audio podcast, I really hope you guys uh, come hang out with us next month or a month after that or whenever. We do this every month. Um, we do it live so we can talk with people and chat and have fun. So maybe come out with us and uh, and watch it live next month. Yeah, you're not yeah, doing it was... on, on normal weeks, normal weeks and months. You might be doing things on Fridays, but no one's doing things on Fridays anymore. No, so yeah. we'll 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 see you we'll see you all here next month. Okay, okay. <laughs> yes, Just... all of you, literally all of you. There's like yeah. there's hundreds of you. I know there are because I see the download numbers. Yeah. So yeah. we'll yeah. see you. <laughs> all right. Um, yeah, so if you like what we do here at Doof Media and you want to see more of it, head on over to our Patreon page at patreon.com slash doofmedia and consider donating a dollar a month or whatever else you can afford uh, and you will get access. Um, well, it's not true anymore. <laughs> Sometimes you're just you just Ron Burgundy it, Matt. I was literally trying to delete this thing as you were talking. Well, head on over to patreon.com slash doofmedia and check out all the different levels you can donate at for a bunch of different... Uh, awesome rewards and bonus things that we do do that yeah thanks scott (laughs) back to you um 
once again, if you have any questions or comments about this show, any of our book clubs, or just want to talk to us about a thought you had on anything, uh, feel free to reach out to us on Twitter at Doof Media or email us at doofmedia at gmail.com. Uh, we'll see you guys next month. <laughs> I was trying to highlight it and delete it because I saw it coming, and I was like, Matt, no. Um, I, I, I thought I'd be able to, like, rephrase it in a way that made sense and i was like no it's just wrong now you can't make it make sense <laughs> <laughs>